Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other behavior which interferes with the orderly conduct of the Gary Sansing Public Forum. Each speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. At the chairman's direction, the Gary Sansing Public Forum may end five minutes prior to the scheduled start of the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting to allow the meeting to commence on time. And now we will have our speakers. We have 14 speakers at this time, and we will start out tonight with Victoria Griffin. Yes, three minutes. Good evening. You're recognized. Thank you. Um, I am opposed to the Thompson Bayou Villa townhomes. Um, the, the townhomes are looking to be built on, the, on a high water table. A water table is the ground, uh, excuse me, is a zero of the ground between the soil surface and the layer of the groundwater saturated all spaces between the sediment and the cracks in the rocks. When the water uh, tables receive can you more speak, water than they can drain off. Ma'am, I don't mean to interrupt you. Pull that mic down, can you? Because we can't Sorry. Hear you. speak into <laughs> that. You. Sorry. All right. Please continue. Okay. Um, the, water, the Thompson Valley Villas are wanting to be built on a high water table. The water table zone is the ground between the soil surface and the layer of the ground water surface um, between the space of the sediment and the cracks in the rocks. When the water tables receive more water than they can drain off due to high amounts of rain or excess when elevated ground, then the ground becomes extremely high. Building on the high water table, if the soil around the under, underneath the uh, building structure is absorbent, this high water table can lead to damage and cause structural issues when the water table rises, uh, level rises. And we have a lot of uh, rains here. There is nothing you can do, even if you regard, um, you regrade the property or direct the water away from the building's perimeter, you won't change anything because when the water table rises, it rises over a large area, not just on the property. The foundation shifts um, when the water table is located too, uh, too close to the surface, so the groundwater can push against the footing of the foundation. Due to the um, higher static pressure, water can seep through the foundation and cause changes. If there is a lot of excess water and the pressure is extreme, foundation walls can shift. Humidity issues. If the walls are still in place and cracks haven't occurred, you can still have moisture problems leading to wood rot, rust, and mold growth. Why is this an issue for the Thompson Bio Villas? If they are built, it is very possible that they will not be structurally built and become not only an eyesore for the future, but by building on this land, this will disrupt the high water table to other locations and property damage to the long established surrounding neighborhoods and causing flooding issues, especially on Wood Run, because we are lower plain than, than all the other subdivisions. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Next up, Will Smith, followed by Timothy Smith. Will Smith, you're recognized. Good evening. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Anyway, I want to address a situation concerning the speeding in neighborhoods, you know, in family neighborhoods. Yes, sir. You know how these cars be coming through here, man? I mean, 40, 50 miles an hour. It's children and things like that are in place. And I've seen so many accidents on the street that I live on until it's pathetic. And uh, I live on East Street, by the way. And I'm, I'm just wondering, if some speed bumps or something can be done to slow these car these vehicles down, you know it's it's unsafe, and the lighting is pitiful also. So, uh, sir, there is a process to get speed bumps in your neighborhood. You would have to get petitions signed by your neighbors. It's it's actually quite a contentious process in, in some of the areas we've get had. Get them signed by the neighbor? Yeah, so if you'd like. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. What, what, what's, I think we spoke, but what, what's your address on East Street? 205. Well, that's, what's the intersection? What between inter Gregory and Wright. Gregory Wright. And I, I think you mentioned to me, and I think I saw you somewhere, but here's the problem, Jeff. That's in the city. Uh -huh. oh, okay. And so there's nothing we can do. You'll have to go to city council. Okay, so I have to go to city council. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I now, didn't realize that. You was telling me who, what, what I should do. Well, I, uh, now that Lumen May has told me you're in the city, that's that's that uh, takes our process yeah. out of the window. Off get a petition off. signed. By yeah. Me. Call call Delarian Wiggins. <laughs> call who? A councilman Delarian Wiggins. Okay. And then he can give you the process because our process is a little different from the city process. Okay. But I know exactly what you're saying. I have a lot of friends that live over there. You yeah, know, man. I go to Ferguson Center every day. It's, 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 yeah, it's bad. It's but it's in the city. Yeah, I think we bumped into you, but it's in the city of Pensacola. Okay. Yes, sir. 
Thank you, sir. So get with the city? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. You too now. Timothy Smith, you're up next, followed by Pam Weirick. Tim Smith, 310 West Sunset Avenue. Uh, through the grapevine, I've heard you guys have kind of worked out what I was coming up here to talk about. Yes, sir. The line item at the CRA. And uh, what, I've, what I understand is that uh, the lien will be reimbursed at the end. That's, that's what we're trying to do for you, yeah, to make an and accommodation. I'm good with that. And I just wanted to say thank you for yeah. working with us because I really need the help. Did she reach out to you? Today? Yeah, Claire okay. Long did yes. call me today and talk to me, and she said she was waiting to hear from you guys to yeah. move forward. Yeah, so uh, we're going to, I mean, uh, there's, certainly I'm going to support it. I believe there will be support on the board for it, because it's, it's, it's something that doesn't really put us out on a limb. It actually, you would be taking all the liability for a couple years, and uh, so that's what I'm going to work toward. We've got to iron it out, and, uh, but stay tuned. Yep, I appreciate it. And, 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 and uh, her boss, um, What's the halls in the back? I just talked with him. I don't know where Claire is right now, but just talk to him and we'll work it out. I, I was listening this morning. Oh, okay. I appreciate I, you, that. You'll talk to Wesley and he'll get with Claire. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. May, yes, sir. Mr. Bagosh. Hey, I've got a quick. Do you own unopened right away in Molina? I do. Well, okay. can't tell can't me. North can't tell me. Okay. Correct. I recognize the name from the email and you are just north of where the weeklies are. In that. Right. Okay. All right. I, I, I recognize the name and it's, but it's also, you know, perhaps a kind of common name, so I wasn't sure, but I was going to put a name with a face if it was you. All right, it nice was. Nice to meet you. Thank All you, Tim. Right, th All right. Th appreciate it, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you for your help. Absolutely. Pam Weirick, followed by Ricky Weirick. Am I, am I pronouncing that right, by the way? It's Weirick. Weirick. All right. But thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, commissioners. We want to begin as a positive note. I have reached out in emails to a few of the county staff and I have mentioned in past me meetings in my letters, we are extremely pleased. For each email sent, a quick reply came with a positive encouraging response from these county staff. We have been blessed to have had visits from the engineering staff. Mr. Blanchard and Reggie, I had updated uh, pics of each rainfall and the continuing issues with our dysfunctional 50-year-old ditch. A heartfelt thank. Thank you to Mr. Blanchard for his visits, his patience, his explanations, and attempting to address the issues. Work was done further up Weller Ave, a drainage that sends water to the designated creek. However, it was well above our road, not near our ditch, thus three days of rain came again across the road from the entrance to Schooner Landing, directly to our ditch, directly to our property. Yesterday, a person who checks mosquitoes in standing water was at our ditch, yep, been standing there for months with serious insects. We here today asking again an update concerning the flooding issues caused by holiday builder Schooner Landing. The builder is still building causing drainage mud sediment into our property. In the last few days, we have rained, we have observed in the rain the cars going back and forth from the back of the subdivision in mud, water flowing, and sediment. It's very dangerous. So who is accountability? We're still asking. It's a swamp. It is actually Jones Swamp. Thank you, and we're looking forward to seeing appropriate measures brought to please protect our property, but again, I am grateful to Mike Kerb, Ms. D, and the flood defenders, and also to our county staff who has come, observed, seen the obvious, made positive suggestions to correct us. Somehow it does take a village to, to get this taken care of, and we want to thank you from Ricky and Pam Wyrick. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank you very much. Ricky uh, Wyrick, are you gonna wave in support of that? Good, after, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who come out. If y'all get in touch with their supervisors that come out and looked over this situation, I'd like to thank them for their advice and for the things that they think needs to be done. But I was kind of curious. Uh, do y'all send people to look over the property that these people are going to build on and, and survey it out? We have a process, the de development review process, so it's a, it's a thorough process, but yes. Um, and then once things are built, we send a team out to inspect it as well. Okay. Uh, sometimes so things happen. I mean, you know, we've had several in my district that they had to go back and fix some things. So, I mean, it's, it's not a perfect process, but yes, there is a process. You know, it seems like that maybe y'all could uh, get the builders 
to put in adequate drainage for their properties instead of putting in what they think is adequate yeah. and Can you causing the other Can you folks to. Hey, it, that's part of the process. That's part of the process. We have, a, we have stormwater engineers. Anyone that applies for this has their okay. own engineer and they have, to, they have to maintain the water on their property. In theory, that's what they do. They submit written plans, engineered designs. But again, it's, it's not always a perfect plan. A lot of what we're dealing with are things that happened years and years ago, things that were approved years and years ago. It's a battle I'm fighting in my district on Highway 98, subdivisions built in straight up wetlands. And to this day, we're still fighting it. So not a perfect process, but there is a process. Right, but two, two feet above my, my property is not a, that, that can't be a mistake. Especially when you got adequate tools to tell you that it's two feet above my property. So I, I'm just curious at, at that. And uh, uh, I hope that in the future you could ask the builders to be absolutely sure that they're not going to drain this on and if come to some uh, conclusion for them to be uh, held responsible even after they built their houses. Now, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Ida Kreiser. Mr. Follow Chairman. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Okay. As, as she's making her way forward, the new school that's being built out there. On, Sor on Sorrento? Or which one? Behind the rock. There's one going in behind the rock yard. Yeah, in a that's real, on Sorrento. Okay. Yep. Real wet. Is that in the area? Is that yours? Yes. It, uh, wait a minute. No, that's still District 2. South side even, of Sorrento. Even now? Yep. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure where the district. All right. Yeah. Okay. Really wet. It, it, it just reminded me that, you know, obviously we have a bunch of problems out there. The water table is very high. And then we're putting tens of millions of dollars, I don't know how much, Lots into a new, new school. Yeah. Okay. And, and that, that piece of property, I'm a little familiar because they started it right before I left. Um, it does have a lot of wetlands areas, but it's my understanding that it's, it's been mitigated. And Already. the way they've designed it okay. is are on the dry parts of that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, wet, it's a wet area. Okay. All right, uh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Ida Kreiser, you're recognized, okay. welcome. I, I've never done this before, so please forgive me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All of you have got a letter um, that I gave you last month. I found out a few, couple weeks ago that October is National Safety Month, which means hit and runs, it means car accidents, it means work-related things, it's the whole gamut. Okay, so I'm asking instead of the dates that I put on that letter, if we can make it October 5th, 12th, 19th, 26th for the day and for some type of celebration for the 8th, the 15th, 22nd, or 29th for victims, whether it's a car or a gun. Yes, ma'am. They're both weapons in the wrong hands. <laughs> and my son was killed because of a hit and run driver. And because of your interview and my interview on WER3, we're going to get lights through five or six counties on Highway 98. And eventually they'll pay for my son's light when it gets to that light. But even the agencies in our, in our county it depends on who you are. I'm a senior citizen, I can't get no help. It's been almost 20 months. Whether it's with groceries, whether it's help with Shine to do their job or anybody else, I'm stuck in the cracks with everybody. And I'm sitting with a broken toilet and I've called Commissioner Maines' office more than once. He's out in the community with everybody but nobody cares about me being a senior who's lost her only family. I care about you. And if you look at the graffiti bridge, that took everything I've got for the next three months. And there is a picture on the graffiti bridge for my son and others, which were victims of hit and runs. And I would like to see if we can take a moment of silence for those victims. We'll do that today when I start the meeting. In fact, it's my, it's my um, turn to do an invocation. So in, in lieu of that, we'll do a moment of silence in, in honor of your son. 
and I, I know you have a little bit of time remaining, but I wanted to let you know um, I'm happy to bring a proclamation um, in October uh, in, in honor of we've safety. Got, we've got one. From go but okay. they never announced it on W Air 3. We had Crosswalk Awareness Day yesterday. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that, but October for safety, if you, if you call my office and ask for Debbie or Kay, um, my, uh, my, my intern, we will get it done for you. Hey, we'll get uh, it. Jeff, yes. if you don't mind, um, we, we, you emailed us. We've been working on this. I know FHP does, I think, the, the month of October as, as the awareness, uh, hit and run awareness. Um, if, if you want to talk to Angela right here, she's she's been working to see what we can do. I, okay, I'm, I'm, we're on it. If, if if you don't mind, or no, no, please. Either way, yeah. but yeah, because I mean, even the agencies, Mana sends me to my doctor. I go to my doctor, get a letter from Mana to get food delivered, and I can't get it, and I'm on Social Security. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. we, we, there's multiple services in the community, and we could, we just got to plug you into the right. They people, don't so I, help. Will Angela? Yeah, help we'll, her? we'll help. We'll help with that, and um, and, and again, we'll, we'll be happy to, to reach out to. Uh, I mean, the state attorneys, the sheriff's office, anything we can do to try to help. Uh, and I don't know where the where the case stands. If they if they've found any. Well, if you know where Little Caesars is in Chowtown, I mm -hmm. almost got hit by a car at a crosswalk a few weeks ago. You know what the excuse was from 911 when the cop came, and he was wonderful. We have to witness it. If that would have been a child, that child would have been dead. Yeah, we, we appreciate you coming tonight. I do, we appreciate you and thank you. I, 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 obviously, our deepest sympathy and condolences with you. And I know that my, my aide, Audra, has been responsive when you've called our office and we'll continue to do whatever we can. Okay, next up, uh, Shirley Pirates, followed by Teresa Blackwell. Hello, my name is Shirley Piritz and I live at 1385 Finley Drive. I am here today to speak in opposition to the proposed Thompson Bayou Villas rental complex. I would like to address traffic issues. Finley Drive is not an arterial road. It is not a connector. It is a dead end local road with only 36 homes. It has a current traffic count of 200 vehicles per day, which approximates five and a half trips per home. If 185 rental units are added, we can anticipate over 1,000 new vehicular trips per day. Finley Drive is not long enough physically to accommodate hundreds of vehicles during morning and evening rush hour. If only one car wants to turn left on Jernigan Road, all of the other cars will back up behind them. This traffic jam could be mitigated with a left turning lane. However, Finley Drive's right of way is not wide enough to accommodate a turning lane onto Jernigan. The same is true with JoJo Road. Likewise, Jernigan Road is not wide enough to accommodate left turning lanes from Jernigan onto JoJo and onto Finley. The nearest arterial road to this proposed development is Nine Mile. The most direct access to Nine Mile is West Side Drive. With Walmart and two big Pen Air buildings, it already serves as a connector. The developer, in my opinion, should build a bridge, place all of his entrances on West Side Drive, and quickly access the arterial road of Nine Mile. The width of these roads and the right-of-ways and all this information was not a deep, dark secret hidden in a ledger in the county office somewhere. It was readily apparent information when the purchaser made his investment. Likewise, the proximity of Thompson Bayou to West Side Drive and the need for a bridge is evident just by a mere drive-by of the property. Just because the purchaser apparently failed to exercise an appropriate level of due diligence before he purchased is not the fault of current residents. We ask you, our county commissioners, to protect the citizens by stopping this development in its current format of exiting on Finley Drive. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Teresa Blackwell, you're recognized, followed by Gerardo DiCepolo. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm here, first off, to um, thank Kevin Blanchard. Um, I'm allergic to dog fennel, and DR Horton had a fine crop of it growing in back of my yard, and so Kevin solved the problem for me, and um, Tim Day called also to check to see that someone had was taking care of it, and so I appreciate that. I told him I had every confidence that Kevin would be able to handle it, and looks like he did. So, and then secondly, 
I live on Wonder Lake Road now, I moved. So that road accumulated a lot of dirt because there's a, a pretty much of a slope from Frank Reeder. So it accumulated a lot of sand on the road. So my husband called the road crews. They came out and they spent like a good part of the day uh, hauling dirt out from the roads and cleaning it up really great. So, so that was nice. Um, and then also, um, I wanted to, I've checked on the, I've been watching the Beulah Master Plan and what's happening. Now it's been two years on that since it was first put out. <laughs> so, um, so it's been extended multiple times. At one time we had one other applicant uh, in, in addition to the one. And uh, recently we had the same situation and, and the second applicant turned out to be a non-responsive bidder. So, what I'm saying is, we've been at this two years. I think the purchasing department has done all they can. I know we don't like single source purchases, but it's time to just say we've got one good bidder who is responsible and who is perfectly capable of doing this work. We need to, get to justify that and go forward with it. And only the county commission can do that. Beulah needs a master plan. Uh, to protect some of what is left of the character. Uh, it doesn't all need to be subdivisions. So um, that's it, and, and if I have time, the only other thing I'll just stick in there real quickly is, I don't understand Frank Reader Road. There is one portion of that, which is 45 miles per hour, which we have to turn left onto that 45 mile per hour, and there's a hill, so we are very careful to make sure nobody's, because people do fly from Beulah Road on that 45 mile uh, per hour part. Mm -hmm. So why is just that one piece 45 miles per hour? The rest of it's 35. Right. So I, I don't know who we'd talk with here. Would, would, would I, could, I could speak with Chris Phillips from traffic. Uh, you're talking about from Beulah Road going west? Is going west, going is 40, west. But, so, but until it, once it gets into the densely populated areas, it goes down to 35. Right there. Well, it's, you know, there are people all on the road I everywhere, and there's Illyrial subdivision there. It's 45, I think, there. Uh, we, can, we can ask so, Chris, we can ask Chris to, to take a look at that, because I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought it was 35 the whole stretch. Yeah, you it would think be. it would be. It, I think it, it should, should be, because yeah. you go, for, Beulah Road is 45. Yep. Nine Mile Road is 45. Yes, Why is Frank Reeder? Yeah, I don't uh, disagree with So you. it's just, a, you know, not right. Yeah. And, I'll, have Chris, and, I'll have Chris Phillips and the traffic uh, department look at it. Thank you very much. Yes, Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. All right, next up, Gerardo DiCepolo. Welcome, you're recognized. Good evening, and thank you for your time and this opportunity. Yes, sir. My name is Dr. Gerardo DiCepolo, and in behalf, here, in behalf of my son, who is detained in the Scambia jail. He is at risk of losing his life, and even his life. He had a very serious accident, and he was in treatment. And, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, his uh, health provider from Galileo Health. Says, Gabriel, you're at risk of losing your leg if not treated. Dr. Mulligan, Dr. Line Weaver at Ascension uh, Healthcare, Lower, uh, Dr. Lavashek, Baptist uh, Hospital, concur. Mm. He's been denied the needed care. He, um, he is forced to walk, and he's missing about two inches in his tibia. He has three open wounds that require skin graft. He's an imminent risk of getting an infection. He is not being given his medications. He's not treating with the daily care of his wounds. He is not um, treated or scheduled to get his three surgeries, and we are looking here about a, a nine months to a year of treatment. He was in treatment, mm -hmm. and he was Martian active because we, he is bipolar, and he has a serious mental situation, and he's been put in today in infirmary in isolation, so it's, they're compounding the problem, and he has to walk. So in short, ah, he has DVT, the risk of DVT, he can have a thrombosis and die any moment because of the injury in his leg. So basically what we are asking, 
that he's released on his own recognizance to continue treatment or the jail pay for his treatment and take care of all the needed care, which is urgent. We've been trying to reach the jail. We have been trying to reach uh, many uh, authorities in the county. We haven't heard anything yet about this. Um, sir, I appreciate you being here, and I will ask staff to look into the issue. There are many things that you're discussing but that are outside of our purview. If he's in jail and he's there because a judge has ordered that, we have no basis to override. We, in fact, we, we don't have the ability to, but any inmate in our care receives medical care. So um, I will, uh, because you've come and asked um, and you've mentioned your name, I will personally ask staff to look into it, and, um, and we will do what we're required to do. Thank you very much. The situation is very simple. It's a budgetary issue for the county. Uh, we spend a, no, the, sir. No, sir. Sir, we, the chief is getting up and he'll talk with yeah. you because I'm very concerned, but the chief is back there. Yeah, but yeah, we, I, sure. Mr. Chairman, th this is, he, the son is represented by council. We have referred okay. some well, communications. Okay, I didn't know that until just now. Yeah, we, we have re referred communications about this to the chief and his staff, and so I do okay. know that the chief is familiar with this particular situation. Allison, in the future, please tell me immediately if that's the case, because I was not aware of that as I'm sitting here speaking ad hoc. Okay. I was not aware that he was. Please let me know immediately. Well, not him. His son I is represented that. by counsel. I understand that. Yeah. Thank so, you. Know, my so point, I can't, we can't. I, I understand my point as a taxpayer is the liability that she presents to the county from the budget point of view, besides the life, of course, of my son. Understood. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anita Geiner, you're up next. Uh, Chief, excuse me, Chair, because I, I get these way too often. Chief, real quick. Okay, wait. Just wait one second, Anita. Is it, I mean, so, uh, do, are can we, we talk any, about this? Yeah, okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask him a general question. All right. Are, are we providing the care that we need to provide for the inmates? I mean, is, yes, are, are we having any problems? Yes, sir. Not to go too far down the, the rabbit hole. Because I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I'm saying general. All of his medical appointments are scheduled. Okay. And of we, we don't have anybody in jail, okay, that's not being okay. treated if they got open wounds, correct? Absolutely not. We're good, sir. Uh, all right. Thank you. All right, Anita, you're up. Thanks for being here. You're recognized. Good afternoon. How are y'all this afternoon? Great. Uh, I am Anita Gaynard. I reside at 1395 Finley Drive, and I am here in opposition to the Thompson Bio townhomes. Uh, I oppose this development because it's incompatible with our existing neighborhood. It's going to change the character and the quality of our neighborhood. We have a, a road that is a dead-end road that has 36 houses on it has no thoroughfare. I bought that house because not of where, not the house, trust me, it was an old house, but because of the neighborhood. And so that is like critical to me and, and I spent my money to buy that house and it's an investment. So anyway, so where this comes from is I want to say that it's gonna also affect the traffic and all the other things. But the main thing I want to talk about was the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan is the basis for the Scambia County Code of Ordinances and the Land Development Code. So per section 103, 1.03, the intent of the plan is to, quote, maintain and improve the quality of life for all citizens of the county. So chapter nine of the housing element of that same plan begins with protect the character of existing residential neighborhoods, which I am in, an existing neighborhood. And yet, the Land Development Code, which implements the plan, does not adequately protect our neighborhoods. So for example, um, I went and I researched it all. The planning board has authority over the comprehensive plan, because I was like, well, who is in charge of it? Who's, who's the one that's over it? But you know who actually appoints the members of that, right? Y'all appoint the members of that. And that's who votes on the comprehensive plan, They're, yet they are supposed to be keeping up the comprehensive plan. Um, and we also have county staff here that are supposed to be writing the land development code enforcement areas to make sure that everything is going like it should. But when you ask them about it, they just tell you their whole job is to enforce what's written. So what I'm really, I guess what I'm really trying to say is I find it totally incomprehensible that the land development code is written so it does not protect existing town home, existing homes. For example, you can have someone that 20 feet from your backyard, you've got a three-story building and they're looking into your yard as you're in your pool or over there mowing your yard, how's the yard going? I mean, it's crazy. So I would like to ask you, 
to take and work on getting the comprehensive plan rewritten and then make it where it does protect us because I believe that that's something that you can do. You, you always say you can't vote on it. You can't, but you can vote on putting somebody that's going to do their job in those positions. Please. Thank you. Five seconds. Thank Getting you. better. You got it. Charles Krupnik, you're up next, followed by Brian Wire. Yeah, Charles Krupnik, uh, 14500 River Road, Pensacola, and president of the Perdido Key Association. <clears throat> Summer's moving on, and I wanted to uh, mention briefly several Perdido Key issues. <clears throat> Tour season this year is better than last year's disruptive, what we referred to as wet, Wild West atmosphere, probably because the Pensacola Bay Bridge to Pensacola Beach is open and day visits to the key are less. But unauthorized parking and acts of vandalism are still problems on both private and public property, uh, with some signs sawed off and public restrooms damaged. Uh, note that porta potties must be used now at <coughs> Perdido Key Beach Access 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Sheriff's, <coughs> Sheriff's Office attention has increased, as has some fish and wildlife presence, but regular beach patrols of some, by some authority, particularly at night when beer parties uh, have occurred, uh, would help. We're also concerned about the 325 unit apartment complex uh, being constructed just north of the Theobars Bridge uh, near the public supermarket. Now, the Canal Road, Perdido Key Drive intersection to be used by new residents is already very dangerous, so hopefully new traffic patterns are being considered. Some changes were approved by county commissioners in July 2021, but I'm not sure of their scope and whether they can handle the new development. We're looking forward to the Perdido Key Drive Johnson Beach Road Roundabout and hope construction will begin soon after vacation season. We're similarly hopeful restore funding uh, for the east portion of the Perdido Key multi-use path will be finalized and construction completed. And I'll speak to the two path items uh, at the regular meeting. Uh, concerning paths and roads on Perdido Key, uh, proper use of golf carts and similar vehicles is a growing concern. Uh, golf carts or low-speed vehicles should not be operated on any Perdido Key paths, but you know LSVs can operate on roads with speed limits less than 35 if they're properly equipped. Uh, rules need to be publicized and enforced with particular concern as the Perdido Key multi-use path moves forward. Uh, it looks very much like a golf cart path, but it's being built only for pedestrians and non-motorized transportation. And finally, as I've asked for several years, <laughs> Please consider underground utilities for Perdido Key. Orange Beach has them, Pensacola Beach has them, Gulf Breeze is moving in that direction. Be a major aesthetic difference to the island, promote tourism development, and I suspect would be at least as good as above ground utilities for storm recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. And by the way, uh, Charles, thanks for sending that information that you sent yesterday. Oh, I appreciated that. Thank you. Brian Wire, followed by Dan Danforth. Good evening, Brian. You're recognized. Welcome. Good afternoon, Brian Wire, 6061 Chapman Circle, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to offer some thanks. We recently had our office uh, supplier diversity uh, event that we're going to be having in uh, September the 22nd. But in, in June, we did have a how to do business with your local government. Uh, Jeffrey attended it. He did a great job, Jeffrey Lovingood, mm -hmm. along with the city and, and our, ourselves. We had a good, good attendance. In fact, Clara and Audra were both, both there. And they gain a lot of value out of being there and learning out what's, go what's going on for the county and the city. And then last night we had another event, how to do work at your local government. I want to thank the county for hosting that at Park Place. We had a great turnout considering all the other events going on in town last night. And some citizens were actually very impressed with the information that was being provided by Lindsley Stevens and also by Tina. Uh, one of the citizens even said, I feel good that my tax paying money is being used in a way to help understand more about, about purchasing. So, Great feedback from the businesses, and thank you for the hosting that event. I also want to give you one of our new chamber directories and also give you a save the date event for our event in September. Okay, sure. This will be the Pensacola. 
Okay. This will be the Pensacola uh, Supplier Diversity Event. We'll have about 40 different tables there with departments from across the states, the Department of Corrections, the Department of uh, Wildlife Services. They'll be there and give business a chance to come and see them and figure out how to do business with them and get contracts and get relationships going. So to save the date for you now, there's also some flyers of a table set up we had for 2019 and an agenda of how the agenda went in, in the past. Uh, Commissioner May has uh, came before and opened it for us, and I appreciate you coming in, uh, in the future maybe to open it as well again, Commissioner May. And that's really it, and I want to thank also Commissioner May for helping to do a proclamation for the Motorcycle Safety Awareness Week. I was out of town, and Commissioner May and uh, the individuals filled in for him. But thank you so much, Commissioner May, for that as well. Fantastic. No problem, and Brian. more details to follow soon about the Supplier Diversity event in September, but I just want to give you an early advance notice now. I appreciate the information. Have a great night. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Dan Danforth. Followed by Chris Kerb. Dan Danforth, you're recognized. Thank you, gentlemen. I have a PowerPoint I need to put in here. Uh, hang on one second, man. Uh, David Hero, hang on. We got our guy that'll do that. The PowerPoint? Yeah. Or do you want to do Is no. someone going to help? Yes. Oh, that's okay. Which one? Oh, you have to open up the uh, e drive. Peter, are you going to come in for an assist here? My computer. Oh, right here. Right here. All right. Is that we'll it? We'll get it going. We got multiple. You got multiples. That's, that's from this one. Go. Cool. My computer. That's that one? Thing. Is it e drive? Uh, Did you say D drive here? Yeah, the D drive. Can you see the screen? Uh, thank right, you. You've got Com three minutes starting right now. Thank you, Commissioners, for your time. I don't know how you do it. I'm telling you, it's insane. It's, it's a lot of fun. You're trapped in an old infrastructure. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to tell everybody in, in the Scammon County, Santa Rosa County, everybody in America, I can fix your drainage issues. It's simple. What happens when you drill a hole in a table? You pour water through it, it goes down. There's a layer underneath our ponds and streams and, 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 and ditches that uphold the water. And when it becomes saturated, it daylights. EGRP, you have two amazing projects in Pensacola now. So I want to talk about those real quickly. But thank you for what you do. Wow. Uh, somebody help me advance this thing. I can't see. That's the zoom. Yeah, just got to go know. to the far right and pull it down. Just go to the far right. Pull it. Pull it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just do that. Okay. There we go. All right, so we're Project Hydrology. We bring innovative solutions, infrastructure, proven infrastructure, cost effective to increase public safety and flood mitigation. So I want to talk about public safety tonight and how this automated infrastructure can help you. Uh, so what are, what are our goals with applying smart water management automation, flood mitigation? Did you know about 40% of natural disasters account for flooding? So in risk management, situation awareness, predictive analysis, communications, access, discipline, jurisdictions during man emergency management functions, and floodplain assessments, fostering an in uh, interoperability program, continuity across all emergency management functions, first responder to safety, necessity of deployment, real-time data, and mitigation, provide solutions related to the need, strategy, capabilities, operational mission, and cost. I've given this county probably 30 estimates in every one of your districts. I just need your support. I, turn on the, t t turn it on. Right now, facilities is limited by a $5,000 voucher, but some of these projects I've given you across the board for the last three years, four years, uh, are, you know, $20,000, $30,000, but they'll fix the problem. 
and it's proven, it's guaranteed. So uh, this is what we're talking. How do we how do we fix some of these issues? You got about thirty seconds, so you got to yeah. wrap it up. All right, thank you. Uh, we built a smart, resilient, and secure community for today and tomorrow. 2050, 2070, everything you're doing now is a reflection on us, and that's why you're having what's going on now. It's, it's, it's overlapping. So here, I'll let you read these slides. They're going to be become, but let me tell you shortly about this product right here, a Sir, AOS. You're, you're not going to have time. You've you got 10 seconds. I can lower the base flood elevation by three feet, and we're doing it. I would suggest you send the presentation. Send the presentation to each of us. Yes, sir. There's your time right there. We can and, reduce um, retention ponds by half. Yep. I appreciate you being here. Send the presentation. It's just three minutes is not enough time, but it's not fair to other people. Yeah, so, so appreciate you being here tonight. I uh, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, can, can, can someone give these to all of y'all, please? Absolutely. If yes, you'll read Tim. this as a story, this is a device. Okay. Thank you. Our infrastructure is guaranteed and proven. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Chris Kerb, you're recognized. Yeah, that's his jump. Right. I that's yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. I just want to give you a little recap. I've been doing this about what, a year and a half with flood defenders. Um, don't have a whole lot of new stuff. I think we've already said what we need to say and keep saying it. Sound like a broken record. A lot of my flood defenders today, um, they, they decided they weren't going to speak today. Uh, we're up to 2,800 members, and uh, lately I've been focusing a lot on our candidates that are coming up for uh, election. Been spending a lot of time, and a lot, really a lot of time in Santa Rosa County. And one of the candidates said, uh, "Flood Defenders has a solution to flooding." What well, we do? I've already told it to you. It's PPIM, plan, protect, invest, and maintain. Um, Y'all have done pretty good. You got a plan. You started that in 2015 after the major flood event of April 2014. It's $417 million, 228 projects. That list is about well, a little bit more than 228 now. And, Probably approaching 650, 700 million now. Um, I'd like to see y'all post your plan, other than what was done in 2015 on your website, as it's updated. That's the way it was originally set up by the SWAT as a living plan. Protect. Well, you've heard from folks, uh, Schooners Landing, Thompson Bayou Development. By the way, Thompson Bayou Development. Uh, that's starting to extend into a much bigger public town hall meeting group. Uh, I believe the folks in your district, uh, Barry, uh, uh, will be uh, interested in that project as well uh, from the Scenic Hills neighborhood. Anyway, uh, Andrew Bluer asked me to pass something to you. Speaking of protect and plans, um, he'd like to see y'all add the uh, Muldoon project that y'all have under design, the Velma, Muldoon, Softly Field area. I'd like to see y'all add that to your uh, web page. And I think on Godwin Lane, he, I'm going to check that during a flood event uh, or a rain event. He said, I think it might be a little bit grading needs to be done over there till there's inlets where Buckland ties in on Godwin. But I'm going to take a look at that for y'all. Anyway, um, plan protect. Protect, wow. We're still using obsolete rainfall data. I've told you about that. In Santa Rosa County, I told them about a 2,700-acre development called Jubilee, two inches over 2,700 acres. That's 19.6 million cubic feet. Thank you. Apply that to your Scenic Hills Basin and your Thompson Bayou. Thank you. That's water that's not accommodated. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Brown? Jean Brown, is she here? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Followed by Kevin Wade. Good afternoon, commissioners and everyone. I'm Jean Brown of 1475 Finley Drive for 54 years. I oppose the Thompson Bayou Villas development. I support 
Finley Drive neighborhood with its owner-occupied single-family homes on large lots, low traffic on a dead end and a dead end street, quiet and safe. Today I have some thoughts on the drainage, stormwater runoff, flooding problems, which is a major concern. The drainage and stormwater runoff are already a big problem on Finley and in the general area. Construction of the Thompson Bayou Villas rental townhomes will make our problems much worse. I have attached there for you section 13, 1 South 30 map from the property appraiser and a preliminary plat of Thompson Bayou Villas. About the general area, section 13, 1 South 30 map shows three tributaries from the west, including at least three large ponds on Jernigan flowing into the large pond on Finley. Thompson Bayou continues northeasterly through a pond on Jojo and enters parcel two of Thompson Bayou Villas, where there are wetlands, buffers, conservation easement number one, and a wet detention pond. In Hurricane Sally, the pond on Finley topped its dam and sent a deluge toward Jojo and Wood Run. What happens to that small wet detention pond in the next hurricane or major rain event? A blowout? Then what good is the wet detention pond? Jojo West Side Drive intersection is already flooded. On parcel one between Jojo and Finley, there are two tributaries flowing through the northeast Finley Drive parcels, continuing through the east side of Thompson Bayou Villas, where there are wetlands buffers, conservation easements number two, three, and four, and a dry detention pond. Converged streams flow on into Wood Run subdivision. Generally speaking, runoff flows downhill on the slightly sloping terrain from east to west on the site. A whole lot of it flows on the street, making a cut from street onto site onto my yard, flooding it and flowing northwest to Thompson Bayou. Will stormwater runoff flow uphill to reach the dry detention pond via storm sewers? How functional is that? All of the Thompson Bayou villas are located on the west two-thirds of parcel one. It's now 100% pervious will be mostly paved over. Are the slopes of the dry detention pond on top of the JoJo extension right of way? Will the site have to be built up to achieve drainage? What will be the consequences to all of us Finley Drive residents? Will the developer be required to correct these? The uh, rainfall broader flows from south and the east. The street serves as a major drainage conduit. The ditches are full. Uh, before they get to the four stormwater stores where the straight part of the street intersects the circle. Jean, There's you... very little water reaches the drain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, Remember Finley Jojo. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Kevin Wade, you're recognized, followed by our final speaker, speaker Eric Sharplin. I don't have any other speaker forms. I don't have a speaker form. I don't have it. So, okay, you, you, so you'll be after. Thank you. I would have brought a smaller computer, but I broke the refresh button on it, pounding it, pounding it, pounding it for a month now. Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. Uh, State of Florida Division of Administrative Hearings. Cases number 21 37, 53, 54, and 55. Oh, Douglas Underhill was the respondent. The most serious charge, number 96 in the judge's recommendation to the ethics board, number 96, <laughs> the most serious charge concerned Commissioner Underhill's release of the shade transcripts. While the undersigned considers Commissioner Underhill's release of the shade transcripts to be reckless and ill-advised, the evidence did not establish that his action was corrupt within the meaning of section blah, 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 number 97. The undersigned agrees with Commissioner Underhill that his violations of section blah, blah, blah justify a public censure and reprimand. It's nice seeing empty chair. Maybe we'll just have empty chair for the rest of the term. The, Meeting was wonderful this morning. Thank you. Thank Number you. Thank 98. You. Commissioner Anil's non payment of legal services to Clark Partington should have been disclosed. 
because that conceivably could have represented conflict of interest. Commissioner Underhill's failure to do so is exacerbated by the fact that he paid nothing towards his debt in 2018 and 2019. Non-payment was a subject of the ethics complaint. Failure to disclose this justifies a $5,000 fine. All of these things are going from the judge's recommendations back to the ethics panel, but multiple causes, like multiple. It's just amazing, amazing. And this is, this is, I, I cannot, I cannot stand looking at Facebook. I've been off of Facebook for a while, but I went back to Facebook for a while. Don't want to be looking there, but daily, daily, that empty chair is churning out <laughs> horrible things, calling everybody else in the world corrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we don't need oath keeper deniers. And hopefully the chair will remain empty and you all can keep having good meetings. I have no problem with his empty chair. I think it's great. Uh, next up is uh, Eric Sharplin, followed by our final speaker, Melissa Pino. How are you doing tonight? You're recognized. Well, good evening, Mr. Chairman. I was very disappointed today with the ruling the judge made, so I'm sorry. Y'all are going to hear Commissioner Underhill crowing like a rooster all over the Internet because it's like he's beat the bullet. And it's, you know, he's already made a charge against Commissioner Barry telling everybody, rally the troops, that he is the author of the 401A plan. And I said, Doug, you're absolutely crazy. I mean, and he's making up just wild stories and y'all got a $5,000 a year pay raise? That's news to me. Not true. But you know, I just feel sorry for you guys that y'all have got to put up with him for the next next uh, couple of months. But I can, I can sleep well at night because I know y'all know how to handle him. And my friend, Melissa Pino, she knows how to keep him boxed in. She's been doing it for four years and I'm sure she's gonna continue. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here tonight. Final speaker tonight will be Melissa Pino. Thank you, Chairman Bergash. Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Pablo. It's amazing. That's the third time that something that I've signed up for hasn't made it over to you. So thanks for your I diligence. Think they, they accidentally added two for Chris. Checking on that. Um, Eric is wrong uh, just on this. It's a, it's a great ruling. Um, it made perfect sense. Uh, he's a two-bit crook. Has been his whole life and he'll continue to be. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And um, I have stayed out of the D2 race. I uh, have been completely neutral. I even planned on blanking my vote. I became so alarmed after the recent candidate forum that took place on the west side because it became clear that Mike Kohler is a Doug Underhill reboot. And that was enough to snap me out of my neutrality fast. Now, he may not end up being as corrupt on the two-bit stuff, and God knows what's going on in the background with Doug, but he's already got a whopper of a campaign violation, hauling around on a jumbotron, and putting down $200 twice in kind for a jumbotron that would have started at at least $5,000 a day to rent. And there are other questions there, too. And this is why, in my opinion, Commissioner Underhill can't stand him because he's jealous as all heck because he's looking at himself starting out again and everybody says, oh, you know, he's so prepared. Yeah, I know somebody else that was prepared. It certainly didn't do our district very well. Chance Walsh, I don't have anything bad to say about Chance. I've been talking with Chance for a long time. Chance has been completely absent from this campaign cycle. He admitted it to the PNJ. He's been having trouble with his restaurant. While I empathize with the small business concerns, how is he going to get up to speed if he gets elected? He hasn't been walking doors. He hasn't been holding meetings. He hasn't been talking to constituents. And my fear is he's going to need somebody who knows what's going on and hits the ground running. And he's a longtime friend of Jonathan Owens. So Jonathan be looking for a job for a long time now. So for that reason, I just wanted to announce publicly with you know, a few weeks left, 
you know, early voting starts, I have officially endorsed Kevin Brown for the D2 race. I've had many meetings with Kevin at this point, and I do believe that he is the only person with the wherewithal and the contacts to fix our infrastructure problems, to hold FPLE's feet to the fire. He's been incredibly helpful already on a screaming emergency that we've got in Navy Point with FPL. He can do these things. Now, I know people are concerned about, well, the Tallahassee connections. It gives me pause, but at the same time, it's wherewithal at a time we desperately need it in D2. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Seeing no more speakers, uh, we are going to adjourn this. We'll start in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, we'll start a regular meeting. We're adjourned.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats, we're going to start in about one minute. Thank you.
All right, good evening. This is the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting, August 4th, 2022. It's 5.37 p.m. Please turn your cell phones to the vibrate, silence, or offsetting. The Board of County Commissioners allows any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other behavior which interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Upon completion of the public comment period, discussion is limited to board members and questions raised by the board. This evening, I'll be bringing the invocation. I'll be bringing a moment of silence. So I would simply ask that you would stand and join me to observe a moment of silence. And then please remain standing uh, as Commissioner Bender will be doing the Pledge of Allegiance directly after. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank please, you. Please join me in a pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Are there any items to be added to the agenda? Madam Attorney? No, sir. Commissioner Bender? I'm just going to clarify that uh, I did have an item, but it is on the agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, so. It, it is not an add-on, but it is. It was added on to the agenda. I appreciate that, Commissioner Barry. No. Commissioner May. No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Underhill. Myself. No. <laughs> Debbie. All right. Okay. Uh, at this point, the chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Pass, pass the agenda. Okay. Motion second on the agenda. Please vote. All right, that passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not here. Um, okay, next up, we're going to go ahead and have a quick Commissioner's Forum. Commissioner Bender, you're recognized. Yes, sir. I mentioned it a little bit this morning when I, um, Michael Capps came up, but I, I did want to just highlight the fact that the, uh, the marquees on the Bay Center uh, demo starting on that and uh, expected to be done in about a week and a half, and, and hopefully, I think he said by the which, end. I'm sorry, which sign are you talking about? Are we talking about the one on Gregory Street or the, the big both. one? Uh, but, but, but plural. Okay. Plural. All right. I'm sorry. Yep. I didn't catch that this morning. Yep. So uh, they're going to start with the one on, on the on the building, and I think then go to the one uh, out on Gregory. Who's um, paying for that, Robert? But uh, are we paying for that? I think we have insurance. That, that That's an insurance. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we took action on this what January, February, something like that. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, it's been a long time. And uh, maybe not not maybe a little bit more recently, but anyway. Um, but it, I know, Stephen. I think you've you've asked about it. I mean, I mean, it's an eyesore, and and I think the vendor we went with was this is still a little bit sooner than some of the other ones had proposed. So, uh, looking forward to having the the marquees up and operating soon. Right, and, and Robert and we passed this a while back, and I mean, we've talked about the scoreboard, we've talked about the signage. I just you know, I was not here with Mr. Caps, but I was I was watching when he came down this morning. At some point, I mean, yeah, I was just in. Hoover at the Hoover Center. I mean, all their signage. I mean, they have they selling it to Coke, to Gatorade, to all those people. It makes no sense that uh, a, a venue like that that we're not taking the uh, advantage of, of the marketing opportunity uh, to put it on those signs. I mean, and I was I obviously in, in D.C. this weekend at a tournament, and I've kind of been all across you know the country, uh, and most of these. Uh, public venues and sports arenas I mean there is some type of signage on the sign that's being sold where they're making money so so he said that West Florida Hospital is is the, the marquee sponsor uh, and and they'll be getting their artwork up on uh, on who gets so does that go to the SMG does that does that come to us I mean how does that work uh, I mean I believe it goes into the operating fund I, I don't know I'm sure they probably get they might get something um, but I, I mean, who determines that rate? Do they determine that rate, or do we determine that rate? I, I would have to pull the. I'd have to pull it to see. I mean, they would have negotiated the sponsorship figure. I don't know. Other than that, yeah. I, don't know that. I mean, and, and that's fine as long as it's going back into the building. But I mean, every opportunity. I mean, we talked about it. I mean, Stephen, since we've probably been on the board, I mean, we just need to be selling it. We have prime property that you know we ought to be selling um, the marketing rights to it. So even. 
Yeah. Antennas on the top of the building or something. I mean, yeah. There, there, there's yeah anything. Yeah. Anything to lessen the subsidy. Right. I, I would say I, I think there is some. Uh, I think we'd have to look into that because uh, I was I was told there's some advertising component that may not be allowed. Um, so. Uh, well, I mean, so I, yeah, I, I just like I mean, all I'm, advertising I'm, dollars go to the building. Right. Well, I, I don't know what the contract is. We have the attorney there, but I mean, it, it's a public asset, and so I don't know. Wes is not here, but I mean, and staff, Debbie, in my opinion, should be looking into that and, and figuring it out. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to go. I don't really want to go on what, what, what somebody was told. I want to go on what's what I'm, it is. I mean, Michael just texted me. He said all, all, all advertising dollars go to the building, which is. Mike's a good man, but we should be more aggressive in helping him. I mean, I mean, visit and all the marketing. I mean, we should be. I mean, it should be a collaborative effort that we're working, you know, with Mike and his team, and trying to generate as many dollars as we can if we, if we have assets. You know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't care if the name's on the side of the building. I mean, we should be selling that building. Yep. Sell the building. All right. Stephen, you're recognized. Not sell the building. Maybe, but maybe sell the, city, sell, maybe sell the, the marketing of the building. No. We, we can sell the building. Freudian too, I mean. slip. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what you say is what they hear, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, want to uh, to announce that there's going to be a, uh, a cleanup in Cottage Hill on Wednesday the 10th. Uh, so a neighborhood cleanup in Cottage Hill on August 10th. I don't see. Is Clara in the audience? Well, I, don't, I don't see her. Perhaps she's listening. She but, was here, but yeah, maybe she's listening. She was certainly here this morning, um, and I should have mentioned it this morning. But I want to thank Clara and her staff for getting that. Uh, for getting that coordinated and get that, getting that set up, those are uh, I know we're doing them, you know, all all throughout the county. But there's certainly there's certainly good things when you see the amount of participation that uh, that happens. Uh, it gives you it's it's one of the indications that you're doing something that's a that's a good thing. You know, Absolutely. we see that amount of participation. Um, and I want to mention uh, on Saturday we did a food and food and backpack food and backpack distribution in Molino at the uh, Molino Community Center on 95A. And it was a fantastic event. Michelle Salzman, uh, State Representative Salzman, was the uh, was the organizer. Arranged, uh, you know, arranged for the food distribution. Uh, I believe made a lot of the phone calls and, and coordinated a lot of the community partners. Um, I want to specifically thank, uh, in addition to Michelle, uh, Kevin Stevens, ECUA uh, board member, was there and, and working hard, um, as well as Sheriff uh, Chip Simmons was there with you know a handful of his people. He had some cadets that were helping with traffic. We had a tremendous amount of vehicles there lined up um, I'm told beginning at 5:30 or 5:45 in the morning even though it wasn't starting until 8 and they weren't wow. told to line up until 7 but there were apparently multiple vehicles there before 6 which is you know again gives you know some idea of the of the need um, you know I don't think that people are lining up going that much out of their way to be there to get what's given out at a food distribution that aren't in need so it's uh, you know indicative, certainly indicative of the need. Um, additionally, I want to thank International Paper, the mill manager, can't tell him Scott Taylor, who's a you know good friend and a good uh, you know good friend, a good community partner. He had 15, 18 of his employees out there volunteering, as well as uh, Rick Byers uh, had a team from Florida Power and Light out there helping handing out LED uh, handing out LED bulbs, and you know also doing uh, doing a lot of work. Um, you know, you can, if you saw any of the pictures on North Scam, you, you might can see that there was a lot of work done amongst some of those folks. I took Jack and Sloan and we kind of stood around and stood around <laughs> and chit chatted and <laughs> those things. But the, uh, the kids had a good time and, um, uh, and it was great to see, uh, it was great to see that many volunteers out there working to help, uh, to help a community that, you know, a handful of them are, a handful of them are a part of that community, but the truth is the majority of the people that were volunteering are not. And the fact they were out there, it, it means a lot. And I know it meant a lot to everybody that made their way through the line. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berry. Commissioner Berry, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Commissioner Berry, it was my intent to try and get out um, to your giveaway on, on Saturday. But unfortunately, I was not able to. But and unfailingly, uh, the reports that I got that it was, it was great. And I know some of our, our media partners uh, we're, we're very supportive and we're, we're excited to be able to help. I too want to thank Claire and her, her staff and uh, Audrey and our team for the Inslee cleanup. From what I understand, from uh, that it was very successful. So we, we certainly appre we certainly appreciate that. 
certainly want to again uh, thank our summer employment youth Escarosa. I mean, we had 165 young people. I want to personally thank uh, the managers, the department heads, uh, who were so gracious to bring young people in to allow for them to work in your department because that's really what it's about. It's really about growing your own. Uh, shame on the departments that didn't take anybody. Uh, I hope in the future that you do. Uh, but for those who did, we, we certainly uh, appreciate it. Uh, and secondly, we, we certainly uh, want to thank um, our partners at Community Health, Ms. Sandra Smiley and uh, Cena Madison and Reggie Dogan and Sandra Donaldson and the whole team at Community Health who partnered uh, with District 3. And I think we did about 665 uh, book bag giveaways uh, on uh, this past um, Tuesday. Uh, as a matter of fact, Horace, I heard you came through and tried to steal six of them, but we caught you. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> we, <laughs> uh, but, but that's fine, Horace. But we certainly appreciate that, and we know our team summit. Uh, again, they'll be at Brent Ballpark th this coming Sunday uh, doing another giveaway uh, that's kind of generated from our young people who came out of our team summit, as well as uh, Reverend John Powell and Truth for Youth will also be giving it out. And Commissioner Barry, I mean, even when you look at your giveaways of book bags and food, I mean, we had we started at three and people were lined up at noon. Uh, it shows um, the need in our community. Uh, and, and people say, well, you know, they go from, you know, giveaway to giveaway. But, I mean, people don't wait in line for three or four hours for a book bag when they don't need it. That's I good. mean, you know, you know, certainly. And so it shows that poverty still exists in our community uh, and everyone needs a helping hand. And so, uh, quite frankly, um, we want to continue to fill that gap and thank all of our partners who are doing things and doing giveaways and making sure that our children have what they need to be successful. Uh, and I'm sure Jeff will say something, but we know that before our next meeting, school will have started. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's important. Uh, for us to support our children and making sure that they have not only you know school supplies but they have the proper clothing uh, they have everything the health hygiene items that they need those are some of the things that we're working on and, and partnering with and everybody can make a difference i mean you can help a child in your neighborhood a child in your church or a child in the community center and so i want to thank leroy williams i think we had over 230 young people at evanwood community center and miss carla thompson uh and all the kids she had at brownsville it's probably you know the only programs in the county uh, that um, uh, didn't have a charge uh, at, at, at Evanwood this year in a partnership with the school district and the Oak Crest School and the GSI guys for their support and making sure that our kids had a successful summer. So sorry for being a little long, Mr. Chairman, but I missed this morning, so I appreciate it. Thank no, you so much. Thank you. It's all worthwhile. It's good stuff. It's great stuff, actually. Um, I want to, uh, unfortunately, there's sad news to report. Um, a member of our team lost her mother, uh, Joy Blackman, our county engineer, just got back. Uh, after an absence uh, for a number of years, we hired her back, and sadly, her mom passed away. So let's keep her in our thoughts and prayers. And um, obviously, uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to her and her family. I also want to take a moment to thank um, the Florida Department of Transportation. They've, uh, they've heard from us. They've heard from the community uh, regarding Sorrento Road and numerous uh, unsafe uh, issues with that road. And they're out there right now working on about 10 different aspects of that road. Um, including adding some rumble strips uh, to the, the portion uh, of Sorrento Road, which I think is probably the most dangerous between Blue Angel uh, over to Bower. And it's, it's dark at night. It's, we've had a lot of head-on uh, fat, fatal wrecks out there. So I appreciate FDOT's uh, uh, work on that. I also want to take a moment to thank NAS Pensacola skipper, um, Terrence Shashati. He uh, introduced me to several members from Tallahassee um, regarding the, the base access issue, it's, it's um, obviously everyone knows there was a previous plan to go through the base. That's something that it looks like it will be cost prohibitive, but there is another plan emerging and, and later this month there's going to be a, um, a teleconference online and there's some grant opportunities available. So right now our District 2 representative is not here, the chair is empty, but um, there will be a new District 2 commissioner and I look forward to working with him because Navy Boulevard, as you go into that base, is blighted, it's ugly, it's embarrassing. And I wanna, from district, it's not in my district, but I drive it every day, go into that base, and most importantly, um, when we have funerals of American heroes who are, go to their final resting place, um, that road should look a lot better, that community should look a lot better. So there's a grant opportunity available, it's very exciting, 
um, and I had the teleconference this past week that will allow us, if we can come up with some money locally to help match, to allow traffic to go through in, what, in what's called a, um, a, a loop, I guess for lack of a better word, or a cul-de-sac or an enclave, which will allow access to um, the National Seashore, the golf course, the museum, and the cemetery, and most importantly, will not jeopardize the missions. Um, that was one of the things that I was speaking uh, with the captain about. So I appreciate his time, FDOT, and uh, Chris Phillips. I gotta give him a shout out. Chris Phillips from our staff, um, I've looped him into the conversation. He will be uh, attending the August 26th um, teleconference webinar about accessing some of this new grant money. So that's an exciting thing for our area. A lot of folks have asked about why they can't get on the base. Um, there's numerous reasons why. There's a lot of folks that are working to make it happen, but this could be another exciting avenue. So I look forward to having more conversations uh, with the new District 2 Commissioner when he comes aboard, whoever that person might be. Uh, I also wanna uh, mention that the Bellevue Library, which has been in the works for a while now, we had you know some issues uh, with the supply chain, other problems, we had multiple burglaries to the construction site, we had windows that were not coming. Um, the good news is it's coming together. We've got the building. Uh, we're working on the inside of it, and we will have a grand opening for that library, Bellevue Library, September 16th. It's a Friday at 11 a.m. The entire community is welcome. We're going to speak with the uh, principals of Bellevue Middle and Bellevue Elementary. Hopefully, we can get the students out there like we did for the groundbreaking. It's a great thing. It's, it'll be the first public library in District 1, so I'm very, very proud of it, very excited about it, and I appreciate everyone's hard work. It's been a tough project, and it's a real interesting look on the inside. I can't wait to show it off. So that's September 16th at 11 o'clock. Debbie, anything from you? Okay, well that's our commissioner's forum. Next up are the proclamations. We will be adopting one proclamation this evening and we'll be ratifying. The chair would entertain a motion. So move, Mr. Chair. Second. Motion to second on the proclamations. Please vote. All right. Proclamations passed 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill absent this evening. Um, Bart Siders, are you going to be, who's, who's, uh, a Bart? Okay, here he comes. All right, tonight I get the honor of giving an employee of the month, and I just want to say a couple of quick words before I read the proclamation. I'll just tell you, I've been in this a long time. Uh, we hired Andrew just a little bit over two years ago, and I'll tell you, just in my 35-year career, probably one of the best hires I've ever made. Uh, this man knows what he's doing. He's extremely intelligent. But the, the thing I love about it, most, most really techie guys, you know, do no earthly good because you can't understand half what they say. <laughs> but what Andrew is able to do is he's got great interpersonal skills. So he's got a re he knows how to communicate with others and, you know, both verbally and written. And so it's just a joy to have him. So I say all that to say this. So uh, whereas Escambia County has established an Employee of the Month program to recognize one employee to represent the various departments. And whereas Andrew Tutton, the network coordinator in the Information Technology Department, is selected for the Employee of the Month for August 2022 for the standards of, of, the, of excellence that he has displayed in the performance of his duties. And whereas Andrew began his employment with the county on February 25th, 2020, and provides excellent service to the citizens of the Scambia County through all of his assigned duties. And whereas Andrew leads our network team and is responsible for designing, installing, and troubleshooting network systems, including wireless, to meet the functional objectives of the Scambia County Board of County Commissioners. This includes all network routers, switches, firewalls, and wireless access points that connect employees to their files, applications, and securing them to the net internet. He is also responsible for the implementation and maintenance of the network management software, change management, and architectural documentation, researching, analyzing, and implementing software patches or hardware changes to fix any network deficiencies. And whereas Andrew has been instrumental with changing out our in, all of our network, let me say that again, changing out our data network infrastructure from Cisco to Aruba, which requires him to re-engineer each site. Once he completes the COC and public safety's complexes this, this year, all, every BCC county facility will have been upgraded. And that's in two years, by the way. 
Uh, Andrew also led the project to install Wi-Fi to 40 county parks and community centers. This included the addition of uh, Palo Alto's firewall uh, management platform called Panorama and, and allows us to securely manage over 50 plus firewalls deployed across the county. Andrew was also a key member of the cybersecurity team. He can, uh, continually reinfor reinforces our security posture by locking down our network and immediately patching vulnerable systems when needed. Another role he has on the cybersecurity team is that as the local agency security officer, otherwise known as the LASSO for the BCC, and is currently managing the criminal justice information systems, which is CJIS technical audit that was performed by the Florida Department of, F F F of Law Enforcement, FDLE, for the jail. Andrew has the following certifications. He's a Cisco CSCNA, Juniper JN CSA, Comp TS Security Plus, and, and he's currently working on his Palo Alto Certified Networks uh, Security Administrator, which is a PCNSA. Um, and whereas, Andrew is an excellent team member and is always willing to assist anyone at any time. Andrew is a very proactive and is always looking for ways to improve our network security posture. He never complains about after hours call out or working after hours to apply patches and network changes so that, as to not to impact uh, business continuity. Since uh, the BCC provides network conne connectivity to the constitutionals, Andrew has developed great relationships with their IT network employees and assists them with technical network issues on a regular basis. Andrew recently assisted the Office of State Attorney by configuring their network connection to FDLE. And the, uh, here's a statement from Chris Bloom. I just wanted to say, uh, super mega kudos to Andrew for getting our new FDLE router up and running. This was a huge for us, not only risk from a risk management standpoint, but for morale as well. In any event, Andrew came through with some very technical and creative engineering and got us up and running yesterday with zero downtime. Our users didn't even know, notice the, the, the transfer. I know he is doing all kind of other things, but he always finds time for us and he's a real pleasure to work with. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, the board, that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, commends and congratulates Mr. Mark Andrew Tutton on his selection as the Employee of the Month for August 2022. Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, Jeff Burgosh, Chairman, District 1, Douglas Underhear, Vice Chairman, District 2, Lumen May, District 3, Robert Bender, District 4, Stephen Berry, District 5. Now you got to give a speech and you got to decipher what he just said about all that stuff <laughs> for the rest yeah. of us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I, out of, I feel very honored to be picked out of many what are um, deserving employees and uh, that without uh, my managers, uh, Bart, Scott, and the, uh, my team, uh, network team that helps me with everyday work, um, I wouldn't be standing up here. They, they really uh, set me up for success. And thank you. Thank you. And, and we have his mother and father here all the way from Huntsville, so we're going to have them come up and take yeah, a picture with us. Yeah, let's get a picture, photo op. There we go. You get in the center, man. Did the clerk's office receive the proofs of publication for the public hearings on the agenda and the board's weekly meeting schedule? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the clerk's office has received all proofs from the Escambia Sun Press. From the Escambia Sun Press. We love the Escambia Sun Press. Thank you very much for that. Chair, would entertain a motion? Move to waive the reading. Second, Mr. Chair. Motion to second to waive the reading. Please vote. All right, that passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill off the dais. Uh, next up, we have public hearings. Mr. Chairman, do we have any speakers on 532 and 533? Uh, 532, let me take a quick peek here. Looks as though we have, really? I have one on the 533. Okay, all right, move the 532. Second. Motion second on the 532. Please vote. Five thirty-two passes four zero with Commissioner Underhill absent. Uh, we're up to the five thirty-three, and we'll go ahead and hear from the speaker, Renee Wind. 
you can you can uh, wave in support if you support this. Yeah, no, I totally. I Fantastic. Think there was questions. Awesome. <laughs> Chair would entertain a motion. So moved. Yeah. Second. Motion to second. Please vote on the 533 to approve it. All right, that passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill gone, not here. All right, next up, we got number nine, Clerk Comptroller's Report. Pam Childers, you're recognized. Thank you, we have two items on the agenda. It's the June Investment Report and documents and minutes that we filed, sir, thank you. Okay, Chair would entertain a motion on the Clerk's Report. So moved. Second. Motion to second on the Clerk's Report, please vote. That passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill missing. All right, uh, Horace, you're recognized. Now, we do have three quasi-judicial uh, hearings coming up yes, next. Sir. So uh, um, do we want to set the table, Allison? Do you, should we set the table on these? So okay. it, with, uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, Please. the first rezoning tonight is Z2022-07. And this one has gotten some attention prior to this evening. So, and based on that, I would like to go down the, the row and ask each of the four of you, if you would please disclose for the record, any um, ex parte communications, if, if you've had any. I will note that I passed out an email to each of you at your workstations. This was an email that was sent by a, a citizen, Christine Rogers, back on June the um, 26th to each of you. Mm -hmm. We should probably make this email a, a part, part of, of the, the record. record just to be safe, to make sure that everyone's aware of it. I can certainly make a copy available for Ms. Bush. So I'll start from my end. I absolutely have had ex parte communications. I've been contacted by numerous residents, phone calls. Um, I've got email. Um, before we ever even had the, um, the hearing, before I even ever knew that this property was going to be uh, brought before the planning board for an upzoning. I had blogged about it and um, throughout the process of developing the rubrics for the Beulah master plan, we had talked about, um, you know, not doing upzonings until, um, not favoring upzonings until such time as we did the master plan. So all of those statements are on the record. So for me, and I have spoken with Allison Rogers, it's very important. Um, this is due process, so we, I, I want to make sure that nothing that I've said in the past jeopardizes the, um, the petitioner's due process. I, I want to be fair, um, but I have spoken with my planning board rep on this. It was a very, very close vote at the planning board, um, and so there's a couple different ways uh, that we could go on it, and uh, I want you to stop me anytime if I, if I stray too far. We have speakers, so um, uh, we could listen to the speakers first before we discuss other things, or at what point would it be uh, prudent for me to read uh, the abstention form? Before, during, or? Uh, um, it, it's certainly a appropriate at any point prior to the vote, but mm -hmm. if you know what you're going to do, it would probably be appropriate to go ahead and disclose that at this point. We do also want to make sure the other sure. commissioners have the opportunity to disclose any conversations. Yeah, so let's had. do that, and then we'll come back to me. Okay. Commissioner May, if you are uh, able, if you could please disclose any ex parte communications and the nature of those communications and whether they would impact your ability to make a decision uh, based on the record in the case. Ken, I didn't even read your email. No, I had no communication. No. Commissioner Barry. I received the same email that you distributed. That's the extent of it. Uh, likewise, I received the email, but that was no other communication. Okay. All right. So um, we've got a couple of speakers on this one. Um, two speakers, to be precise. You want to hear from them, and then here, here's the thing. Am I allowed to say, look, if if we're going to vote to either approve or deny it, I'm going to abstain. Can I say that? I mean, I guess I, I just I think did. you should say that. Okay. Yes, because. Uh, I think you need to disclose on the record whether or not you are able, based on the conversations and ex parte communications, are you able to make an unprejudiced, unbiased decision based on the record before you this sure. evening? Yeah, and I, and I read the transcript, and I spoke to my member of the planning board, and I share his concerns on a couple of specific items. I believe I could, but again, the, the appearance, due to the fact that I've spoken to folks, I've had emails, the appearance of that leads me to probably the decision to abstain if we're either going to approve or deny. 
Now, if we're going to send it back to the planning board, that I believe I, I could make that vote because um, I, I, I wouldn't be approving or denying, and perhaps that's the outcome. But um, then that's kind of where I'm at. Then I suggest you. Yeah. Then I suggest you hold, you hold the hearing and then um, make, make, make a the decision. Yes, okay, sir. let's do that, gentlemen. Um, uh, Melise Sellers. And do you want to give her the, the explanation? You, you Yes, and she did speak before the planning board on this hearing, and I uh, did read the transcript, so I see that you understood that in order to be able to speak this evening, you had to provide testimony before the planning board. If you could please limit your comments to a summary of those statements that you made before the planning board. Okay, I'll do my best to recall what I said. Yes, I know I'm supposed to say only what I said. Um, my name is Melissa Sellers. I live at 9740 Tower Ridge Road. It's the property immediately adjacent and north of the subject um, property. Um, what I said at the hearing was, um, I had to forego most of my comments because of the instructions we received at the time. But I, I said that it's not consistent. I, I want you to take a good look at this. I really do. It's, I don't, I don't, I'm really asking you, please don't rubber stamp it. Um, Tower Ridge Road is about a mile and a half long. It has about 65 properties on it, something like that. I'm not even really sure. I didn't count them. Um, and it, none of those properties, uh, there, most of them, a lot of them are large properties. We, ours is almost five acres. And none of those larger parcels have yeah, been um, have asked for or received an increase in uh, zoning. There are two large parcels that all the residents on that road have accepted in the last few years. We have Vintage Creek at the end, and it's a, I, I had the numbers written down before. I don't have them now. We're talking hundreds of residences. Vintage Creek on the um, southernmost end of Tower Ridge Road, it exits there. And then we have Antietam that's, that's really close to us, and there's uh, quite a few houses in there too. All of those uh, have an egress point onto Tower Ridge Road. Um, that's a lot, you know, it's a lot. Of, and I understand that the heirs have the right and they should be able to build uh, almost 20 units on that five acre parcel. That's already theirs. They can do that. There's nothing we can do, nor would we try to. We have the same right. Um, that the land use change, I mean, you obviously seen it, you've read the transcript, you know what it means. You're talking about going to 50, almost, well, 49. 49. And I have no doubt they'd do it. I saw them squeeze a house in Antietam that I thought would never fit. It was shocking to me that they put that house on there. The gate opens into the front yard, but nobody cared because they bought it, you know, which is good. And I know, I know a subdivision will bring more money into the coffers. The more houses, the more money. Um, I, I don't know where that stops when it comes to quality of life for us. Um, I, my property is about, my house is about 20 feet from that property. It's not in the middle of my, unfortunately, in the middle of of my acreage, it's, it's very close. Um, I'd hate to see my green expanse gone. I know sometimes we can't guarantee that if we don't buy something that's restricted, but um, that's what I ask. Careful consideration, not a quick rubber stamp. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you for being here this evening. Um, the next speaker this evening is uh, Danny Sellers. Oh, three others then, three speakers. Uh, you signed up for the 545. Do you wanna to speak to this item? I signed she up for this. Did. Okay. Okay, well that's fine, we'll, yeah, no problem. You'll be able to speak. I know you were there at the hearing. I saw you in the transcript. So you and then her. Okay. Good evening, welcome. Uh, my name's Danny Sellers and I live at 9740 Tower Ridge. And uh, I don't really remember what I said at the other one, but I, I, my main concern is with the water runoff. Yes, sir. Lots of water. And um, the folks across the street, if they put 50 houses in there or 49, there's definitely gonna be a water issue. Of course, I'm not an engineer, but uh, you can stand out there when we get uh, massive amounts of rain and you see it puddle. And there, they did come out and engineer a more or less a ditch. And um, well, if the pavement and the concrete grows, goes in, I'm, I'm, per, I'm sure there's gonna be an issue for you guys later. So 20 houses I can see. I don't know about 50 though, but okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Teresa Blackwell. I don't have a form for her on this item. Uh, Allison, does that? 
She's, she uh, did speak. She is in the transcript. The, so the, she's okay. She's absolutely okay. All okay. right. You're recognized, Teresa. Okay. Um, um, okay. I'll just start off. Uh, no upzonings until we get our master plan, which is in process now. So um, moving towards, um, you know, happening. Um, so um, this, rezo this rezoning will open the floodgates for many lot subdivisions on the smaller four to five acre parcels that give Beulah much of its character. That kind of density actually belongs on OLF-8. It's already there in our master plan. Um, and the intent of the LDC is that transitional zoning is between lower density and higher density, creating a smooth transition. This application is for higher density between two lower density zoning districts. It is not a transition, it's a bump in the road. Low density residential zoning on the nearly five acre lot already allows up to four houses per acre. Medium density would allow 10. This would more than double the potential housing density. From not, for, it would be from 19 to 49 houses. The LDC says any transitional that you have sh should be in minor indifference. This is not minor, it's 250% increase. The zoning surrounding the property is all low density residential or the even lower density rural mixed use, which is uh, residential use. It's up where it's up to two houses per acres. The nearby Antietam subdivision has smaller lots but than LDR allows, but that is a planned unit development. We got extras there. They agreed to sidewalks, more trees, a walking trail. It's, you know, it's, very, it's done very well. Um, lots of variety in colors and everything. Antietam, and Antietam remains zoned low density. This would create an isolated district of MDR in the middle of LDR and RMU. The county allows spot zoning if it's logical in transition. Um, and uh, the LDC specifically mentions between low and high density residential. Um, okay, so no matter what kind of math you use, 10 is not a number that belongs between, between two and four. The applicant says the rezoning should be approved because that's what's happening in the area. Actually, that entire area uh, has only one very small uh, area, which not it's not really a subdivision. It, it's uh, was grand. It, it's what was there when the zoning was put on land. So it's it's very small. Uh, Oak Haven and Linda Hill or something like that. But those two major subdivisions mentioned previously, those are actually developed within the guidelines of LDR. They're not MDR. So um, thank thank you, Teresa. That's your that's your three minutes. I appreciate you being oh, here. Oh, okay. So to summarize. Until we have our master plan, no to these up zonings. Thank you. Meredith Bush, uh, did you want to speak to this item? Because you were also signed up at. I was signed up, yes. Okay, all right. So you're Hi. recognized. Good, um, evening. good afternoon or good evening. Meredith Bush, 125 East Intendencia. I am the attorney for the applicant on the rezoning. We are asking that you approve the rezoning tonight. Um, it did pass the planning board, meeting all the requirements of the land <coughs> development code and consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, as to the water runoff issue that was mentioned, that would be addressed at the DRC process during development review if there is indeed a water runoff issue. Obviously, the development would be responsible for maintaining its own water or any impacts. Um, as far as the last speaker's comments, and this was addressed at the planning board, the code specifically allows for medium density residential as transitional between low density and mixed use. So while the last speaker touched on the numbers for density only for residential to residential between low density and high density residential, it also between the types of uses. So the code specifies that when you're looking at medium density residential, it's an appropriate transitional category between property zoned LDR and properties that are mixed use. And this parcel is located between those LDR properties and a rural mixed use property meeting that criteria of the code. Spot zoning is not prohibited in and of itself, it's just required that it's shown to be transitional and the code itself dictates that this is 
transitional. Um, I understand the statements regarding the master plan, but there's no moratorium in place. You know, there's no concurrency. So legally, I would just ask that you uphold the um, recommendation of the planning board and approve the rezoning tonight. Thank you, Meredith. All right, I do not see any other speakers tonight. So at this point, the chair uh, would entertain a motion and depending upon what that motion and second is, I'll either abstain or I'll support. Um, chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, do we have any presentation from staff? Um, do you want, Drew, do you want to? Sure, maps. I got the maps. Do you yeah, want to flash them up, Drew? Let's see. So, Jeff, you don't have an opinion whatsoever? I mean, Am I allowed it, to give my opinion? It's your district. I mean, you know. What, you know I'm what just looking at the lawyer very closely. Am I allowed to give my opinion? I've never so known you not to. <laughs> the statute says that one may abstain from a quasi-judicial hearing mm -hmm. if that is to assure that the decision is free from prejudice and bias. Yeah. So I think you, you, you kind of have to fish or cut bait. I mean, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> so I'll wait until I hear the motion because I, you know, if, then, yeah, if it's I, one way, I, I can vote. If it's two other ways, I won't. And I will read that abstention. And Horace, yes, sir. Planning board recommended approval. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was based upon the black and white language of the land development code. The planning board did recommend approval. One of the issues that was that was highly discussed basically was the was the density requirements. Um, when you, when we look at the density, ten is the gross density. The parcel is only five acres. So it's, it's, it's only logical that when you put in hole and ponds and the roads that you would not get 10 dwellings per acre because it's only five acres. Uh, and and Ms. Crawford is correct, even when staff looked at that, the, the black and white language of the land development code, and that's what we have to hear to, at the black and white language of the land development code, that it is a, the code does allow for this zoning district to be a transition that's stated clearly inside the land development code. Um, it, it, it was not a unanimous decision. Um, again, the code does not prohibit spot zoning. So we have to, that's why the planning board did make and the staff make that recommendation due to looking at the black and white language of the land development code as well as the objective nature of it. Drew, can, sorry. Yeah, can, you fly, can you flash up some of the other maps? Yeah. Um, so it, it references that there's MDR within so many feet. Where, where's the MDR at? I don't see it. No, there's, there's not. There's, uh, you've got LDR, north, south, and east, rural mixed use. Uh, as the Ms. applicant Black's says there's MDR within 2,000 feet. Is that, is that accurate? Hmm? I can pull it up real quick. Steven, it says that the orange parcel down there underneath the, the key Under that title. is yeah. an LDMU. Yeah. Well, that's not MDR. That's not MDR. So that's, that's, that's the most I've got on this map. The one to the south, which actually includes a uh, county parcel down there, is low density mixed use. The I'm just saying the, ap the applicant states in the application that there's MDR within 2,000 feet. And I just, I'm, I'm curious where that, where that would be the, and how big a parcel it is. Yes, sir. The, Are they the, referencing outline field eight, the portion of outline field eight that we, that. The large subdivision uh, to the south on Tower Ridge, Vintage Creek, that parcel, or uh, that entire subdivision is MDR. That's MDR? Yes, sir. And that's down where um, okay. Tower Ridge comes down to nine mile okay. on the west side. But what density is actually on the ground? I'd have to add it up um, for that subdivision. Yeah, I, I don't remember anything close to 10 units an acre. I mean, oh, Vintage Creek no, is single no, family sir. residential, no, right? Sir. I mean, so it's MDR, I mean, it's, it's zoned MDR, but the product on the ground is more like LDR. Yeah. I mean, I don't know uh, yes, Vintage Creek. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
I've, I've driven through there, it is. So about, about like that, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So how did the, how did the compatible with surrounding uses, how was that determination made? Can you walk me through that a little bit? Yes, sir. That, that was determined based upon, based upon the, the lot sizes of the, um, of the surrounding uh, that subdivision and the Vintage Creek's uh, 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 acreage. That is why that it was determined because many of the lots, they, they are not that in those subdivisions. They are, they are not large as, as per se with the large lot sites. So that's why the compatibility on the existing was on the ground. And I, I know it doesn't necessarily matter, but did they give indication for what their ideas are for the project? What it, they did not. Maybe Ms. Crawford can allude to what they want to. Just on the I density mean, you, and you can't get single family. You can't get single family in that density, can you? Or can you? With our lot size. Yeah. No, that, that's not enough. Large enough parcel. Yeah. Like, the parcel's too small for yeah. something like yeah. that. Yeah, there's no way it can meet that. There's no way it can get that uh, that gross density of 10 dwelling units per acre because it's only five acres. And, and, and by the time you put in the roads, the, the lot widths, the holding ponds, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be less than 10 dwelling units per so, acre. But a couple of the speakers referenced 48 units on the property. How is that, how are they arriving at that figure and how is that possible? I, I, can, I didn't hear the question. The, a couple of the speakers referenced 48 units on the property. How is, how is that a possible outcome? Yeah. So, calculation. yeah. I think they're just taking the allowable units. Just the math. Units. Just the yes, math. Okay. All right. Yes, okay. Yeah. All right. I did, you know, and I mean, I'm not going to ask him questions. I'm, you know, let folks say whatever they want to say. I just wasn't sure what the, if there was any it, other rationale other than just the math. The just equation. the math. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Any, sorry, Jeff. Anybody else have any comments? Any further comments? All right. The chair would entertain a motion. Then. You know, I, so Lumen and I've been on the board, you know, nearly ten years, and I generally try to find a way to, you know, try to find a way to support um, these type of requests. It's, uh, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that um, you know, the last few years we've seen the, you know, we've seen inflation in home prices. We've seen, you know, the average average sales at a certain level, and you know, the back to what Drew mentioned, just the math of it, you know, the price for, you know, residences is, is on some level also going to be, you know, function of supply and demand. What is, what is the demand? What's the supply? And you know, if we had not supported you know, some percentage just say, you know, half of the up zonings that have come before the board that are now projects on the ground and, and you know, that are inventory out there as part of the supply, you know, who's to say what those house prices would be now, you know, if we hadn't, you know, done some things that I know, you know, some of the residents, you know, directly adjacent to the properties didn't, you know, didn't necessarily support and didn't, uh, you know, didn't care for, didn't uh, think were a good idea. So I, and you know, I do recognize that it's also the, you know, that's the makeup of these positions. You are, you know, intended to lead and, and you know, try to f find the greater good in the situations and, um, you know, in those kind of things. So when I look at these, like any request, uh, uh, you know, honestly, any request from a citizen, you try to look at it, how, you know, how can we help the citizen accomplish what they're trying to do? Um, some things just, don't seem to work though. Some things just don't seem to fit. I don't see how this is compatible with the surrounding uses. That would be the rationale. I think the objective rationale, Madam Council, that's something that needs to be identified if, if we're not going to support the planning board's decision, correct? I think that's a, you know, out of the, out of the, um, uh, you know, the requirements for, you know, approving it, I think that's where it doesn't, you know, where it doesn't seem to 
it just doesn't seem to fit. Um, you know, four, you know, four units per acre, 20, 20, you know, 20 lots on that parcel. That's, that's a number that fits that, that fits that area. And there are, you know, a number of people that, you know, and I don't, they don't, we don't have the owners highlighted on the map that's there, but some of those are also large parcels look to be, you know, eight, 10 acres, maybe 12 acres. I'd propose some of those folks aren't too keen on four units per acre anyway, but that is where we're going. I mean, you know, the growth is there's, you know, there's still a little bit of, you know, still a little bit left in district one and then there's, the rest is, you know, primarily gonna be in district five. Um, again, you know, even trying to have the, the positive outlook of, of, you know, how can I support, how can I support this request when you look at this, some, again, sometimes things just don't work. I, I just, I don't think it's a fit. Um, so, you know, I, I'm certainly open to what, you know, Robert Luma might have to say, but I would, uh, you know, I would support rejecting the planning board's recommendation for approval and move to deny the request based on the compatibility with the surrounding uses. That's a motion I'd second. All right. Are you denying it or are you sending it back to the planning board? Mr. Berry. I'm denying it. Does the second stand? It does. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And so, Jeff, you can't have any comment? I'm I, cut. At, before we take the vote, I'm going to read my abstention form because I won't be able to make the vote. This is one of the ones I won't be able to vote for. Um, either way, approval or denial. The only vote I could have made was to remand it. I, I, that's what I feel after speaking with the attorney. But um, I certainly, uh, we will take the vote. And uh, I'll, do you have that form that I, I mean, since you can't give opinion, I'm, I'm, I, I tend to help person that's their district but I don't yeah. I, I can't help if I, I don't know. Can, can I, you know yeah. again I, I think Commissioner Barry has has laid out the case on why uh, he made the motion and uh, uh, I'd, I'd probably stick to those facts um, uh, in, in that regard I think that's the, the best path forward. Yeah, I appreciate that gentlemen well at this point I need to go ahead and read this disclosure. I will be abstaining from this vote, um, uh, and I'm gonna read the reasons why. Um, I received ex parte communication. I've been outspoken on a number of these issues, and I've read the entire report. Um, I've read the transcripts, um, and even though I believe I could make a decision, um, I do think that there's the perception that perhaps I've been tainted by some, some of these ex parte phone calls and communications, so therefore, in an abundance of caution to preserve the due process rights of the, uh, of the persons uh, and the families who have brought this forward, I am going to uh, abstain. I'm going to file the official form, and that's the reason for my abstention. So without f further discussion, um, the chair would entertain. Lumen, you have your light on? Did you have anything? No, no. All right, the chair would, enter, the, the chair would call the vote. So again, a yes is to... A yes, Except is to the motion deny it. and deny. It. Mr. Chairman, it looks like it's not coming up because that slide's still up, but it was uh, three yes votes and one abstention. Okay, so three yes abstentions, which means it was a denial. Um, Commissioner Barry's motion succeeds, and of course I abstained. Um, appreciate that, gentlemen, and I apologize. I don't like having to do that, but um, in speaking with the lawyer for over an hour yesterday, going through all the different ways, um, I think this was the only way to preserve the due process, um, yes. and uh, we appreciate that. So moving forward next. Yes, yeah. yes. Based, to, based upon what was stated earlier, Previously on item number two, on the on the on amending of the of the map. So I guess that move to drop the 545 drop, public thank hearing. You. Second. Motion is second. Please vote. I can vote on that, right? <laughs> All right, that passes uh, four zero to to. Uh, uh, okay, so next we're moving forward. Yes, sir. Item number one. three is for to, to review the planning board recommendation for a rezoning case Z 2022-08. 
uh, the plan, it was from AGR to RR. The planning board made a recommendation for approval. And we have no speakers to the chair would entertain a motion on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to uh, uh, approve the planning board's recommendation and approve the, uh, approve the rezoning from AG to RR. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please vote. <coughs> All right, that item passes unanimously, uh, four zero with Commissioner Underhill not here. Um, Stephen, just to just for clarification, so we voted for that, and did you lump uh, the uh, the rezoning right into it as well, both of them? No, no. The next item is the rezoning. It's amending the, the map. This is the uh, next okay. item that need to be okay, my voted upon. All right. So this is the 545B. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. All right. So I move to approve the 545B public hearing. Okay. Second. Motion and second on the 545B. Please vote. It, it wouldn't be too bad if we had those. 545, 546, 547. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. Okay. Going forward. And that, yes, sir. And that passes 4-0 uh, with Commissioner Underhill not here. So now we are up to uh, the 540, Item number five. 545C. Yes, Is that right? Yet, uh, yes. It's five, yes. Okay. We have two speakers. Board Here's here speakers. Speakers. waving in support. Close. Okay. Come on up. Meredith Bush, you're recognized. Yes, Meredith Bush, 125 East in Tendencia. So on this one, um, just a brief or a little slight change. So we're actually requesting to exempt the homestead at 1415 Lansing. Um, the owner has come back and raised concerns regarding their ability to finance if, it, if that portion rezones from HDR to commercial. Staff has the updated survey and has no objection. It's about three quarters of an acre in difference. So we would ask you to approve the rezoning that went to the planning board, however, allowing us to make a slight modification to reduce the footprint of the property being rezoned. Okay. Um, so is that is that okay. just one of the parcels? Yeah. Is that yes. fully encompassed one parcel then? So, so the not homestead? the total parcel, but the parcel at 1415 Lansing with the home on it. I'm um, saying, but that, that homestead, that 1415 is, is a standalone by itself parcel. Cor correct. So the, the rear part of that would be rezoned. Um, it'll ultimately, what will happen is it'll become an, a new parcel um, after the transaction. So it won't result in a split zone property, if that makes sense. So we're, we're breaking, we're, they're surveying a parcel apart. Is that what's happening? Drew, Drew if, yes, sir. if the board moves to rezone the other two, 1501 and 1503, and not rezone 1415, are, are you? So Do just they have the survey that to, is going to bear in mind um, when y'all rezone, you're not rezoning the parcels based on their number. It's based on the survey that's given to us. That's how we go into the system and draw in the new categories. We have the survey showing their revised portion um, in the order for this case has reflects that revised survey also. So how order, do they exempt order? out the part that needs to be exempted out? We, I need their motion to reflect what they're exempting out of the motion to, to rezone. The 2.1 acres uh, reflected on the latest survey submitted to staff. But 2.1 is the entire size of what you've given. Is the 2.1 adjusted the, for the removal? That, that's, that's already been adjusted. We took out. It, it didn't show up apparently right. That... Um, we went back and I recalculated it based on the admitted, uh, the new survey. So the 2.1 is amended. So did the planning board hear, hear a different ag aggregate acreage? Yes, sir. They heard a different aggregate acreage? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is stepping down, uh, okay. so just acreage numbers, and I've got the survey. This reflects what she's asking for? The yes, sir. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Chair, would entertain a motion? Oh, wait, we got one more speaker. Yeah. Todd Kimling? Kimling? Todd Kimling, he's, the developer. he's speaking in, waving in support. Do you have anything? Wave, wave in support. 
All right. Chair, maintain a motion. Okay. So I think after hearing all that, it's going <laughs> to move it as presented. Yes. Uh, Smart. That's it. All right. Second. Motion and second to move it as presented. Are you good, Delana? All right. Please vote. All right, that passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill off the dais. All right. And the next item is the amending of the zoning map for 545C. So moved. As amended. Motion is second. Please vote. All right, that passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not being, not being here. All right. And um, now we have our uh, the final plat approval for Dry Creek. Um, let me make sure we have no speakers. I don't think we do, but let me double check. Mr. Chairman, move the item A through D. Okay. Second. Motion is second. Please vote. All right. That passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill gone. And we do have our consent agenda for September the 1st, 2022. No speakers. Move the consent agenda. Motion is second on the consent agenda. Please vote. Consent agenda passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not present. All right, uh, county administrator's report. Um, Debbie, you're recognized. There are eight items on the technical public service consent agenda. There are no changes. We do have speakers on item. I think we have speakers. Hang on. We have speakers on item three, six. We have item, speakers on items three and six. So the chair would entertain a motion. Move the balance. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion. We have speakers for item three on my list. I have speakers for, am I wrong? Three and six? No, sorry. Three and six, okay. Uh, all right. We have a motion and a second for the balance. Please vote. Mr. Chairman, was that speakers on three and six or three and seven? I just want to confirm that I get the. I've got th three, speakers on three and six. Three and six. Three and six. Three Perfect. And six. Thank you, sir. All right. Please vote. Okay, the balance of four uh, of car one passes four zero with Commissioner Underhill absent. Uh, item number three, recommendation concerning a reappointment to the career source, Escorosa Board of Directors. Melissa Pino, we have a speaker. Melissa Pino? You want to wave in support? What, what are we doing? No, no, no. Sorry, I was trying to speak on a rehab grant. I must have gotten the wrong number. Okay. So, thanks. All right. Chair, we entertain a motion on three. Claire, why do we vote on Escorosa board members? Is that, is that a state statute? Oh. Right. Move the item, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Motion a second, please vote. All right, one three passes four zero with Commissioner Underhill not here. Um, item number six, recommendation concerning the disposition of property for the Public Works Department. Uh, Melissa Pino, did you mean to speak on that one? You want to wave in support? The three you wanted was on budget and finance. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't get internet in here, so I was trying to do my speaking and had to copy it from a thing into my word and then search it that way. So I think all my speaking is going to be off. Um, I don't know. I can run back and try to fix it. I was trying to speak on uh, residential rehab and the, um, I think next up was the uh, incentives, right? Um, let's see. No. I'm just going to have to bag it. Okay. All right. So you're good on six. So uh, Chair, we're entertaining a motion on six. That's the final. Move, move the item. Second. Motion and second on item six to approve it. Please vote.
Mr. Chairman, I just. Okay, um, yes, 1 6 passes 4 0 with Commissioner Underhill. It does look docks. like item car 2 3 is mm -hmm. a residential rehab grant. I don't know if it was supposed to be 2 instead of. Yeah, it's probably what car it was. 1. It's 2 3 on the budget and finance. And, yeah, and then, but car 6, car 2 6 is a. FP and L contract with West Bridge Place. Is that the one Is you wanted to one? talk to? Okay, you uh, just you signed up on the wrong one. That's okay. We can we can add it. So you want to talk on car two? That's where we're at. We're on car two three. Now there's a lot of items here. We went through them one by one during the review, but we're gonna pull now. We're gonna pull three. Melissa, do you want to sign up to speak on three? No, no, you don't need to come forward. Just just tell me yes or no. You want to speak on two three? Three and, six. three and six. Yeah, she wanted to do it on budget and finance. Okay, no worries. We do that. And then, how many uh, other speakers do we have? Let me take a peek. Okay, it looks like we've got. Do we have any speakers? Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. You also wanted to pull fifty-seven uh, car two fifty-seven for other just direction to staff. Okay. Or if you could just include in the motion direction on if you're going to give a dollar limit of say for example a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. Why don't we just hold that for discussion? Yeah we're gonna do that. Yeah. We've got three and six from Melissa Pino. We've got thirty eight. We have a speaker Charles Krupnik. Fifty seven we're gonna hold for discussion. And I think uh, forty one we have a speaker. Uh, so we'll hold that one. And forty four we have a speaker. And that and fifty seven we we have a speaker and we're holding. All right, so gentlemen, I move the balance. Okay, we have mo do you did you follow that? Are you good? <laughs> you want let to me, recap? Let it? me just confirm, just in case. Okay. I have that we're holding three, six, thirty-eight, forty-one, forty-four, and fifty-seven. That's right. That's okay, it. perfect. Just making sure. <laughs> Thank yes, you, sir. Okay, so we got a motion. Do we have a second on the balance? Second. Motion a second on the balance for car two. Please vote. Okay, balance of car two passes, 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not here. We're up to item number three. Melissa Pino, you are a speaker. You're recognized. Thank you so much, Chairman Bagash. Sorry about that. Melissa right. Pino, 413 Southeast Boblets. I just quickly wanted to follow up on Tim Smith's thanks to you guys. I just picked one of the rehab grants to say, um, this insurance thing is an ongoing nightmare, and it's like no, we're just people just don't talk about it anymore. Like it's gone, mm -hmm. and it's not. It's just continuing to gain steam with more and more people losing their insurance. I mean, I lost insurance on both of my houses. I went down to Citizens on one after Southern denied my claim for Sally and then dropped me, and now I got a cancellation no, no, uh, notice from Citizens. The deadline of September 10th, that if I don't get the work done on my house, they're just going to cancel my insurance. And the reason I can't get my work done is because I was on a wait list for an architect and an engineer because I got to reslope my roof. And there's literally nothing that can be done about it. There's no recourse. It's just it. I mean, I don't know. I suppose I'm just going to wait and see what insurance the bank assigns me. I was going to say they're going to force place it. Of course, of course they are. And so, I mean, I think that um, the idea that also the only people who don't have insurance right now are the people who can't afford it. I can't imagine why anybody of means isn't self-insuring and getting out of this insurance racket. I cannot wait until we finish these, these rehabs and I can self-insure. Why on earth would I continue to pay money into this system? Why would anybody? So if you're really lucky, you can get what? Five, you know, half, half back on the dollar? If you're lucky, you know? I got $16,000 on $45,000 worth of Sally damage. So thank you, um, really, for finding a way to get around that. And, and I think that you guys are probably going to have more and more insurance stuff come up. And anything you can continue to do as a board to help people, because they're not getting help anywhere else. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate that. All right. And, and that was a group effort. That was Clara Long and yes. my counterparts as well. So Chair would entertain a motion on Move the item. Second. Motion second on item three. Please vote. All right, two three passes four to zero with Commissioner Underhill not present. 
All right, we're up to item six. Uh, Melissa P. Thank you. Um, I again just picked one of the um, things for FPL putting in lights. Um, there's upgrades, MSBUs. You know, when I spoke to getting help from Mr. Brown with FPL, that wasn't just like empty campaigning, because this is another rec no recourse thing. And I've been up in front of you gentlemen before a few times begging you to start thinking about what FPL is pushing on to people. And I just want to raise the alarm. Um, perhaps you're not experiencing it yet, but on Navy Point, they just came in and started slamming in these horrific lights. They're lighting us up like a soccer arena, and everyone is freaking out. People are nailing blankets up to their windows. These things are light trespassing. They're not environmentally friendly. Um, they are, are the, uh, they're high up on the K scale, so they're so bright. They're like the blue, you know? It's hurting our habitat already. It's hurting the frogs. It's chasing the bats away. I mean, this is for real. And the lumens are wrong. So I am grateful that it sounds like FPL, because we had someone with the ability to speak to FPL, is going to be coming in for a meeting on Navy Point on 8 o'clock uh, Saturday morning for anybody in Navy Point that wants to come because they're willing to hear these concerns at least. As I understand it, they're um, thinking about putting hoods on these lights, which are really important, mm -hmm. because this light is trespassing. We got postage stamp lots. It's going not only all through our backyards, but into, into people's windows as well. And so at the city, Two meetings ago, they actually voted a blanket thing for what kind of lights and bulbs they're going to allow FPL to use in, and this will obviously impact Commissioner May and Commissioner Bender's districts um, favorably, um, right down to the K value and the lumens. The, the city council approved it, and already over in the city, they're watching what's happening on Navy Point, and everyone's like, you know, I, we always get the project that the rest of the neighborhoods in town are like, yeah, we don't want what happened in Navy Point, unfortunately. So just be aware as commissioners that it was um, a cost savings. They represented it to the county as a cost saving. We're still on a CRA, so it did make a certain amount of sense but we're actually going to be on the hook for that when the CRA sunsets because the county did not pay forward on our infrastructure. They've been paying as they go on Navy Point. So anything that's left, we're going to be paying for. So just be cognizant of that because as some of these lights go in, you all might start hearing similar stories. Thank you, Melissa. We're up to now. Um, uh, wait, Chair, would entertain a motion on that one? Second. second. Motion is second. Please vote. <laughs> I almost jumped ahead. We're not going to do that. All right, 2-6 passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not present. Uh, next, we're up to item number 38. We have a speaker um, recommendation concerning the acceptance of two public road and right-of-way easements for the Perdido Key multipath. Um, uh, Charles Krupnik, you had signed up to speak and you will be recognized. Uh, Charles Krupnik, 14500 River Road, Pensacola. And just very briefly, I just wanted to appreciate, to express appreciation to Escambia County for working through the various challenges uh, posed by the construction of the Perdido Key multi-use path. And that includes a need for uh, a right-of-way easement proposed by this agenda item, mainly because of the roundabout now to be constructed at that intersection, so it had to be, so the crosswalk area had to be moved further north. So. And I also appreciate uh, the firm, uh, which I believe is Joe Mirabli, the developer's firm, uh, for its consideration in providing the easement as a donation. Yes, I do so, too. Thanks very for your nice. time. Thank you very much for being here. Chair, would entertain a motion on this item? Move the item in the affirmative. Second. Motion and a second. Please vote. That item passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill absent. 
All right, next up we're going to item 41, and we have a speaker, Chris Kerb. Is he still here? Chris Kerb. All right, Chair would entertain a motion. He's not here. Mo second. Motion is second. Please vote on item 41. All right, item 41 passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not here. All right, next up, item 44. We have a speaker, Chris Kerb. I don't see him in attendance. Chair would entertain a motion. Still not here? Yep. No. Nope. Lumen? All right, so Lumen, you made the motion? Yeah. I'll second it then. Okay, we have a motion. So you got that, Delaney? Commissioner May, was that just so moved? Thank you, sir. All right, motion and a second. Please vote. Okay, item 44 passes 4-0 with Commissioner Underhill not here. Um, we're up to item 57. I know that we had asked to hold that. There was some discussion this morning, so Commissioner Barry, do you want to speak to that? And we also do have one speaker on it as well. You want to have the speaker first? Yeah, please. Okay, Melissa, you're recognized. Thank you. So it's unfortunate that the commission has to keep dealing with these things on the back end. You can't just let it run away. You can't not address it. It's similar to the thing that was happening with the EMS where people were, you know, skating on funds and stuff and you had the long, you know, list of, of people like, you know, whether to do anything about this case or that case. You have to deal with it, I get that, but it does have a little bit of like the beatings will continue until morale improves because the, the question that never gets asked is why don't they want to stay? And I know that it's fashionable with the GOP to be like, well, nobody wants to work anymore. No, no one wants to work in a bad work environment with bad management. And that's the truth of the matter. So all the benefits in the world and pay raises cannot offset working with bad management. Yes. There are continued problems in EMS, whether people want to admit it or not. And until the commission starts asking why we can't retain these employees, why are they so anxious to get the heck out of the county? It doesn't happen in every division, right? It's, you know, so, I mean, maybe you should start asking the question about why it is that the minute those people get their bonuses, they're out of here and, and how, how they might be better retained. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Barry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move the item with the amendment that we pursue, uh, that we only pursue items that are, uh, balances that are over $1,000. Second. Perfect. And uh, I, I know we had a lengthy discussion, discussion this morning. Um, and uh, Steve, I'm gonna support this. Um, and, and part of that is, is I think we have some changes coming to the, That's when right. those are awarded. So I think that will cut down on, on people having to go after this. Um, but the other thing is, is, as we discussed, is that there is a cost to go after after them. It is. Uh, yeah. So it, it costs us, I mean, it costs us more to go go after it or- We got a dollar. And, and, it, and it varies. I mean, I've, I've, that was my discussion this afternoon. It, it varies in the cost, but there is staff time there. I mean, it's it's tying up the courts and um, it, I don't think any of us came to this decision lightly. Nope. But there is a, a weighing of, uh, of of what it costs and, and the benefit gain back to the county. Absolutely. Um, so uh, that's that's again. I don't think any of us got here lightly. Um, and uh, of course, we have gone after uh, everything that has been owed to us previously. But uh, it does seem cost prohibitive for us to go after. Uh, some of these and so I'm, that's why I'm going to support this and I appreciate staff forwarding the the breakout and the numbers um, it was it was important to see that and just appreciate that getting sent out Allison you're the one who sent that right was it you take credit I mean <laughs> I think Allison sent it I got it it's an email so um, so we have a motion and a second on that Lumen did you have any thoughts on that no I mean it just didn't make sense to spend the yeah. previous lawsuits we got enough of them Ain't that the truth? All right, so we got a motion a second. Please vote on this. Are you clear on the motion? Yes. Sir. Okay, right on. And yeah, Commissioner, I mean, it's it's like 
you know, sometimes it's it's settling lawsuits so that you don't spend more money defending them, even though you could probably win. Yeah. I mean, we do that all the time. Well, a couple of them you may not win. All right. All right, gentlemen, now we're up to discussion. Now, we, <laughs> we did have a thorough discussion this morning on these items. Uh, as we come back around this evening, we have a speaker on two, um, and we have a speaker on we have speakers on two, three, and four, so um, the chair would entertain a motion, or do you want to go through them one by one? It's up to you guys. So we don't have anything on, we don't have a, a decision to say on one because it's coming back to us next time. Correct. So we don't so, have to really take action on that? Correct. But we do have speakers on two, three, and four. I hear from the speakers. All right, we'll just go, we'll just go in order right down, the, right down the rack. Yeah, I know. That's number, that's number three. We're, you know, we're not going to take action on number one because we're waiting for more information on the, from HR. We're good. We had that discussion. So we're just going to go through them one by one and listen to the speakers. Then we, these are discussion items. We can take action or we can't. I mean, whichever. We, we came to some agreements this morning, and we can certainly memorialize those. But we're up to item two, recommendation concerning authorization of the acquisition of real property on Guidey Lane. Teresa Blackwell wanted to – did you want to speak to that? Okay. So you're signed up. I don't know. It's all – you're – okay. No. no, no, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I move the item A, B, and C. On for two. Yes, for okay. two. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second that. Any discussion? Please vote. That passes four zero uh, with Commissioner Underhill gone. Um, okay, and that was an important one, Stephen, so we got that one done. Teresa, you didn't want to speak to that one. You want to speak to OLF8. So OLF8 is number three. I've got two speakers, Melissa Pino and Teresa Blackwell. Teresa, do you want to go first? Go ahead. You're up. OLF8. Yep, OLF8, number three on the discussion. Okay, um, first, uh, Teresa Blackwell. Uh, I live in Beulah. I want to thank Debbie Bowers, first of all. She, uh, I think she did an excellent job on the RFQ, Request for Qualifications. She wove the master plan throughout, and um, so I thought it was excellent. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, think she is a good plan to talk with those who qualify and, and discuss you know, what they think are good moves going forward. Um, I, th I think um, in the haste to get dollars uh, back fast, um, we may be losing sight of the bigger picture, how to develop in order to get the maximum return on the investment and the maximum tax benefit for the county as well as for the benefit of Beulah. The master plan is not an option. It is part of our land development code. The master plan zoning is already in the LDC. You approved it. it. It is a plan that will give the county the best return on the dollar. I think we need to go back to Peter Bazzelli's marketability analysis that he did at the beginning of the whole master plan process when he discussed what we need to get that commerce there. Our commerce uh, attracting history is, is not too good. I mean, we might want to listen to this great expert, you know, national expert on what we need to do there to attract commerce. You will not attract commerce to a barren field with, without good access to I-10. Um, we need an attractor there, as Peter Bazzelli said. And to do that, we could also benefit the, the Beulah community. Um, go ahead and do, what I would say is go ahead and do those 84 acres, that town center. That's the attractor. Um, you know, solicit for that. And build the uh, drainage. The drainage is already detailed in that master plan to, you know, greatly detailed. There are two lakes on Nine Mile Road. Those could be amenities the public could enjoy um, and, um, and that would be nice uh, for, uh, you know, for, for those who want to work there. Uh, build the main roads. Get Triumph dollars to do that. I mean, I would do that first. The people can wait to get their dollar a buck back and, and, you know, considering that they'll make much more in the, in, the end, in the end by doing this the right way and doing it in a way that benefits Beulah. The town center is not a drag on the amount of commerce. It will serve in a, as an attractor for high-end commerce like Navy Federal. Make a good start 
on a place where people will want to invest, to work, and to live. And aside from that, I agree, Commissioner Burgosh, you all need to keep your word to the people of the county who have participated in that master plan process and to Navy Federal who paid $1.8 million to get that master plan done. And that master plan is excellent. It I is. agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's your time. Thank you. Melissa Pino, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Bergash, Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Boblitz. This isn't um, really anything to speak contrary to what Teresa just said about the master plan, and I have never, I haven't heard any conversation about going against it. There wasn't any conversation along those lines this morning, but what I did want to say is that it's not like the public doesn't notice that staff has been slow walking, selling this property. You know, I mean, or is it just ineptitude? I, you just missed the biggest boom in how long and still waiting for the thing to close and, and the underperformance on marketing it where there's not even a sign up. Why? I mean, I, I do find it curious that some of the people involved were some of the people that were intimately involved when the thing was getting set up for the other side by DPZ and PNJ hmm. for all of the residential building. Hmm. And so some of those same people today are still here involved in this and guiding it. And you guys just haven't gotten any great offers on property when you, you, can't, you couldn't stop property from selling in Escambia County here over the last year or so. It's a little bit odd. Thanks. Thank you. And again, we discussed this this morning. I'm comfortable with that direction. If there's no further discussion, we'll move to our next item, which is item four. Let me go down here. My computer refreshed. Two speakers on item four. Okay, so we have the joint citywide meeting. We discussed this this morning. We're going to discuss this at the Committee of the Whole next week. And we'll talk about our ideas before we go to the city, which I think is prudent. It make, makes sense. But we have two speakers on this. Melissa Pino, uh, we're not necessarily going to take any action on this. Do you still want to speak on it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you're recognized. Oh, yeah. This is the most important one. Um, thank you, Chair Member Gosh. Thank you for bringing this this morning because, as you know, I've been hounding you about where this, where this meeting is. Mm -hmm. And um, Grover is... <laughs> You know, probably melting down on another email string on the homeless as we speak. There's a few of them going where he's just losing his mind. And I, I, you don't even need to go through Grover. You, you, I mean, you know, you could you could fix this with Ann Hill. I don't know who on the county side has been blocking it, but I did want to um, say that you know, responding to Commissioner Bender's comments this morning, I, I was at all those meetings at City Hall on how the City Council allocated fantastic plans for the 3.4 million. It's just that Grover you went around and countermanded all their plans. You know, forced the eviction before people were ready, lied about the fact that they had services, shoved everybody into the county, there were 130 people under that bridge, and only about 60 got services. And you know, you're right about this, Commissioner Bender. They shoved them into hotels, <laughs> wouldn't let them leave the hotel. Told them if they left the hotel, they had to go. They drove people to Beggs Lane, Commissioner May. And then Grover promised that staff was going to be able to handle a smooth move out for people. Never had any plans to. They didn't, they didn't have anything planned. Ann Hill found out that they didn't have any transport, transport for those folks. So she and Teresa got a van and tried to help some of them move things. A lot of them left all their possessions there. And then Grover put a gate with a rent-a-cop. Mm -hmm. And when they came back to get their tents and their bikes and everything else, they weren't allowed on the property. That's not what city council voted for. But strong mayor, y'all. So um, I, the reason that I advocated for this wasn't to have them tell you guys what to do. It's that there's been such effective disinformationing 
about what council voted for that I just was hoping that you guys would have an opportunity to hear what it really was because you're not hearing what actually got voted for by council. It's a fantastic plan. It's a limited amount of monies for different types of paradigms. They don't get to have the money until they sh can show that they've helped people with it. They have to, they're paying up front. It's just that it took time when you've got stuff like the city blocking things with unnecessary fire doors and stuff at the last minute. So I really hope you guys hold this meeting because obviously you've got your own ideas as well, but there are some good ideas that aren't getting through to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Wade, you're recognized. <laughs> All those ghosts from our past, right? Um, Kevin Wade, 403 Southeast Boplets. April 30th, a few years ago, um, I was a glass blower as my primary hobby in pottery and so on for City Art Center. And that rain came and it was all hands on deck. All hands on deck to get past the drama that fell upon us. Um, took about a day and a half to clean up for City Art Center. And at that point, few folks that showed up were neighbors and they said all right we got you we got you clean we're going to go clean our own places now um, and there are about 40 of us that spread out amongst that neighborhood um for city art center is Gulamard and um i spent the next three weeks with a shovel, mucking out homes that had been flooded from neighbors in that neighborhood. Uh, that neighborhood was completely surrounded, what I called at that point, Lake Mana. Um, I was there that morning. I saw Mana Lake. Uh, seeing the homeless camp underneath that bridge sort of brought back uh, heebie-jeezy heebie kind of scaries to me because I remember seeing the water that was there and many neighbors and friends from that neighborhood who they had become homeless. One rain and there were a whole lot of people that became homeless in that neighborhood and there were a lot of people who were hands on deck. And I would, I, watching the joint meeting where you all were blindsided with the Marbet Task Force, which was, <laughs> that was a mess. Oh, I've been watching the city council try to come up with solutions for helping the homeless. And I really believe that between the BOCC and the city council being all hands on deck, some great minds can come up with some great solutions and really go ahead and um, clamp down on what's happening with the money and make sure that it's done right and that we can help all of our neighbors in whatever situations they're in. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And again, we discussed this this morning. Lumen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and we're, we're talking about this joint city council meeting. Um, are you arranging that? Uh, well, I, I've been trying to for a couple months, and, and I, we kept running into calendar issues. People didn't, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. And then I was told the city wasn't responsive. So I just figured we'd have a discussion here on the dice, figure out what's Well, I going. talked to Administrator Hitler this afternoon, and he said that they've been trying to work but I obviously get a meeting to uh, a meeting but the, said. The good news is, though, after having our discussion today, you know, there's some feeling that perhaps we should get everything from our perspective lined up before we go meet with the city, and I'm fine with that. So we, we're good. For yeah, that. I mean, that's what I was going to say. I'm not interested in swapping spit with the city council. Yeah. We get our uh, ideas together and we go. Yeah, to, I mean, w w we should have an agenda set for it before we yeah. come. I mean, and so, you know, just for a couple things for me, when we're talking about homelessness, I mean, the continuum of care dollars that are coming down to this county, there should be a better understanding of that. Mm -hmm. That should be on the agenda to talk about it. You know, I mean, uh, 
FDM, I mean, they just released almost $60 million, I mean, that we should be applying for for, for homelessness, uh, the homeless grant. Matter of fact, Travis or uh, Claire, I mean, who's applying for that grant that's designated for uh, the continuum of care supplement to address unsheltered and rural homelessness? Are we applying for that? I mean, it's specifically for uh, cities and counties and municipalities. Does anybody know? I mean, I, I, it'd be unbelievable to me if we're not applying for that grant. I think we need to be. I mean, if we're not, why? Why aren't we? I mean, we're talking about addressing homelessness, and there's three hundred million dollars, three hundred billion dollars out there the federal government's putting, and you know, there's a continuum of care dollars that are coming down, and those grants are available, uh, uh, and we're talking about having a meeting on homelessness, and we're not even applying as a county when there's three hundred billion dollars out there. So I, I, mean, I mean, that's I mean. I, there was somebody, I would want someone to answer that because that's specifically set up for counties to apply for. Why aren't we applying for it? Do we, Debbie? Do you have an answer on that one? Yeah, no. no we'll, you know, Wes is on vacation. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll. I mean, we got enough. <laughs> well, in, in, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that's why we can't have the conversation. I mean, we 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 should be applying for those grants. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's ridiculous. No, I agree. I mean, I mean, we got, we got a huge homeless problem, and the government's putting out you know over three hundred million billion dollars, and we're not applying for it, but we're saying that we want to have a meeting on homelessness. Well, well I don't. I'm, that's that makes sense. And, but, and I mean, if I might interject, Lumen, the, the reason I I've been because I get a lot of I don't know about you, but I get a lot of complaints from constituents about specific areas. Uh, you know, people camping in the woods, doing fires, and. And you know, I know we, you know, there's all this money out there. We should be applying. And I hope we do. But meanwhile, we do have four million, and right. and I, and I think at some point, you know, we, we ought to figure out. Well, what we're going to do, and I agree. Yeah. And Jeff, so you know, for my vote, you're right. I'm ready to put that four million on the ground. I'm not interested in putting that four million on the ground for a study. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, that's we're what the city wants to do with their money. Yeah. No, I mean, I'd rather put four million to build houses for people and get 10 people off the street I'm not interested in another study like you said we i don't need a study i hear from my constituents Absolutely. they're sick of homelessness and they're, <laughs> they're, they're mad about I mean, it they're, they're sick of panhandlers they're sick of people destroying their property they're so, yeah they want something to help people so let's put money in the hands of the people and, and i think that's that's awesome so we're gonna we're gonna put this on the committee the whole next week good and then we can flesh it out among our board and then once we can take from there then we can have a workshop with the city. The other thing I wanted to say is, I, I mean, just because we're workshop with the city doesn't mean I'm going to give them any money. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree with them. It's just you know they're dealing with the same problem. Maybe they have some ideas, um, and I think it's always productive. To, uh, those meetings always do bear fruit when we used to have joint meetings with the school board and, and the city. So, but I agree with Robert. I mean, it probably makes sense for us to figure out exactly what this board agrees with before we go there. So, mm -hmm. so a week from today, Lumen, we're going to have a discussion about it. We could we ask about the grants. And, and Jeff, I don't think we need a vote, but I, I'm looking at this uh, continuum of care supplement to address uh, unsheltered and rural homelessness. Mm -hmm. That was announced June 22nd, 2022. Uh, in the closing date is October 20th, 2022. I mean, we don't need a vote, but I mean, I think it needs to be a directive yeah. that we apply for these grants. Absolutely. I mean, that's not a, a conversation. I mean, if we don't get the grant, we just is don't it get it. Is it coming directly from the federal government or is so it coming from, from the state? It, yeah, it's coming from feds to the state. Okay. From the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It comes from HUD. Okay. And so, I mean, I would assume that Travis and Eric and Claire and uh, CRA, they would get together to figure out how we apply for these grants. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, let's do it. So no, let's let's spend it. Debbie, if, we could, if we could get a report on that, hopefully tomorrow, I mean, about the protocol of how we apply for this grant. I think Debbie's taking that for action. Okay, I appreciate it. All right, gentlemen, so we're going to have that discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have that discussion next week, a week from today, and then we'll hopefully have that ironed out uh, about applying for that grant. Mm. That does Mel, I need to hire you for the consultant since you're able to find grants that nobody else can find. <laughs> That's right. Well, that, uh, that wraps up our uh, discussion items. County Attorney's Report, Madam Attorney, you're recognized. Just two information items. Both are good outcomes in these two matters. I can answer any questions. The chair would entertain a motion. Oh, it's just information. We don't even need a yeah, vote. Yeah, no. for information. Okay. Any, any questions, discussions? All right, anything else for the good of the order? We're adjourned.